Hello. Welcome to my channel Touching Stories. You're about to hear an amazing story about love and unexpected decisions. Enjoy watching. Study Louisa. With an education, you can't go anywhere, and I'll help you in any way I can, said Brianna to her daughter while she was studying at school. Louisa grew up an obedient, kind, hardworking girl. She never knew her father. She was raised by her mother and grandmother. Brianna tried hard to make sure that her daughter did not need anything and did not feel inferior to her friends. She worked all day long and only spent time with her daughter on the rare weekends she had. One day, when Louise was in eighth grade, she overheard a conversation between her mother and grandmother. How could he do that? Brianna almost cried. I trusted him, and he, what am I supposed to do now? What's the use of crying after the time? Answered Victoria. It's God's will. If it happened, then so be it. I'd like to raise Louise. Her mother wailed. And then there's this. The woman kept interrupting her phrases, so the girl could not understand what her grandmother and mother were saying. Suddenly, Brianna asked, Will you stay a couple of days with Louise while I'm in the hospital? Don't you dare. I forbid you. Victoria was indignant. These are not toys. You should have thought about it before. Now don't anger God. We'll raise it. We raised Louise and we'll raise another child. Louise dropped the textbook she was holding in her hands in surprise. Her mother came running at the sound. What's wrong? How long have you been standing there? She asked. Mom, are you going to have a baby? Ignoring her mother's question, the girl asked. No, you misunderstood everything. The woman began to twist. I need to go away for a while and I asked grandma to look after you. Why are you lying to me? The daughter asked. I clearly heard grandma say that we would raise another child. Her daughter's words confused her. She flapped her eyelashes and remained silent. Victoria still did not interfere in their conversation. But seeing her daughter's confusion, she said, Louise, you are an adult and have a right to know. It just so happens that you will soon have a little sister or brother. Mom, Brianna tried to stop her. Ludisa, don't listen to her. Grandma's got it all wrong. Louise hugged her mother and whispered, I dreamed so much about having a sister. I pray for it every night, and God has heard my prayers. I will help you with everything, but don't take away my dream. Together we can do it. Brianna was moved by her daughter's words. She pressed the girl against her and cried. Seeing this picture, Victoria exhaled with relief and said, Well, thank God, I've got it all figured out. At the due date, Brianna gave birth to a healthy, beautiful baby girl and named her Martha. Louise, as promised, never left her sister's side. And when she was at school, Victoria took care of the baby girl. Brianna had to leave maternity leave after three months to keep her job. Martha's father never showed up at their house or showed any interest in their daughter, so the baby's birth certificate, like Louise's, had a dash on it. Victoria loved her granddaughters. She was very worried about them and feared that they would repeat their mother's fate. She often stroked their heads and sighed, saying, My orphans. Louise did not understand why her grandmother called them that, because they had a mother and grandmother who loved them. But Victoria's words became prophetic. When Louise was finishing 11th grade, Victoria suddenly fell ill. The doctors couldn't make an accurate diagnosis, so they treated one thing or another. But the medicines didn't help. Every day she was getting worse and worse. Just recently, a woman full of strength was dying in front of her family. On the day when Louisa received her high school diploma, Victoria passed away. Louise wanted to go to work to help her mother raise her younger sister, but Brianna insisted that the girl continue to study. Louise entered the institute without much difficulty. Now she had less time for her sister, but she still helped her mother whenever possible. Martha grew up a bright, inquisitive and very mobile girl. She was always happy when her sister returned from the institute and followed her around all evening. She could sit next to Olga for hours and watch her comprehend the sciences. When Martha was five years old and Louise was in her third year at the institute, Brianna suddenly fell ill. Thinking that it was just a cold, the woman did not pay attention to it and continued to go to work. But every day she got worse and worse. When she got to the hospital, it was too late. She was diagnosed with a terrible disease that was incurable. Brianna burned out like a candle in six months. After burying her mother, Louise, who had just entered her fourth year of college, 
was left with a little sister in her arms. From the inheritance they had only a two-room apartment on the outskirts of the city in which they lived. Having learned about the situation in the family, the guardianship and custody authorities immediately came to visit. Despite her older sister's resistance, Marta was taken to the orphanage with the words, You are not able to support the child. You have no permanent income, except for a scholarship, but that is not enough. Get a job and then come to us. For several days Louise went door to door looking for work, and luck smiled on her. She found a job as a housekeeper in a wealthy house. The owner, a woman in her 50s, was looking for a housekeeper, but she needed references. After talking to Louise and finding out all the circumstances that had brought her to her, she took a liking to the girl and took her on probation. If you write for me, I won't hurt your salary and I'll help you get your sister back, Donna promised. Louise tried hard to please her employer, and after a few weeks she managed to get Martha out of the orphanage. She was happy, even though it was not easy for her now. Early in the morning, Louise took her sister to daycare and drove to the other side of the city where she had to take care of the housework. Good thing, even in the lifetime of her mother and grandmother, the girl learned to manage the household. From work, she ran to the institute. In the evening, Louise would go to the kindergarten to pick up Marta and the sisters would return home together. Marta, though she was still very young, often noticed the tiredness on her sister's face. At such times, she would sit down beside her, put her arm around her, and like an adult, say, it's hard for you, Louisa, but don't be sad. I'll grow up soon and I'll help you with everything. The main thing is that we're together, just don't leave me. Louise hugged Marta motherly and replied with a smile. We will definitely manage everything. Louise was pleased that she had found a job and was able to bring her sister home. Over time, she became attached to her employer. The relationship between the owner and the housekeeper was warm, even friendly. The girl was surprised by only one thing. Why does a nice in every way, kind in every way, smart, intelligent, intelligent, wealthy woman lives alone? She did not dare to ask directly, and Donna did not tell anything about herself. One day, while cleaning, Louise came across a photo album and couldn't resist her curiosity. One page after another, she looked at the pictures of young Donna. Some of them showed her posing alone, some had her friends by her side. Only one picture showed Donna with a handsome young man. It looked very happy. Engrossed in the photo, Louisa did not notice how the landlady entered the room. When she saw the photo album in her hands, she said, All my memories are in it. Friends, colleagues, just acquaintances. And who is this? Louise asked cautiously, pointing to the picture of a young man. You're both so happy here. Donna sat down next to her, took the photo in her hands, looked at the smiling faces for a few minutes in silence as if remembering the events in which it was taken, and then spoke. You're right, we are very happy here indeed, she said. This is Jack, my fiancé. We are 30 years old in this photo. We loved each other, I thought, we're going to get married, making plans for the future. And then it was over in an instant. Donna was silent. Lucy felt that it was difficult for her mistress to remember the events of distant years and even more difficult to talk about them. The girl put her arm around Donna and rested her head on her shoulder. The woman smiled, though there was a deep sadness in her eyes. Is he dead? Louise tried to pull her mistress out of her memories. Who? Donna woke up, Jack? No, he's fine, I guess. After a little more silence, the woman pulled herself together and continued. A week before the wedding, I found out he was seeing someone else. What do you mean? Louise was surprised. Why get married if you love someone else? Donna smiled and looked at the housekeeper with a slight squint of her eyes. You're still young. You don't understand a lot of things. You trust people, and they often take advantage of our kindness and gullibility. By my 30s, I had already achieved a lot in life. I had my own business, which developed and brought a good income. I lived in a spacious apartment and planned to buy a house. I could already afford to go on vacation twice a year. Sergi liked all this. You bet. The girl couldn't help her emotions. He was happy to go on vacation with me, Donna continued, not paying attention to the exclamation of the housekeeper. He made plans for our future together every day. He already had a design in his head for the house we were to live in. Us and our children. He dreamed of me having a child with him, or better yet, two or three. 
He had it all figured out. By his own admission, he wanted to marry me, put me on maternity leave and take my place in my business. He gradually transferred the money into his accounts and then, uh, would fly away to his dove, who for the sake of enrichment was willing to endure all this, waiting for him. What a horror. Louise was genuinely amazed. And where did you meet him? Three years before the events I described, he came to work at my company. His good education and experience spoke in his favor. Jack was a quick learner, quick to grasp things. His determination, diligence, and persistence were amazing. At first, he caught my attention as an employee. There aren't many like him. Gradually, our communication turned into a friendly one, and two years later, he made me an offer. I knew him only from a positive side, so I immediately agreed. Before him, I had many admirers, but in all of them, I found some flaw. Jack seemed perfect to me. It's true what they say. Love is blind. When you found out about the affair, did you break up with him? Yes, I kicked him out the same day. After Sergey, no one could win your heart. Louise asked. I was already pregnant when I broke up with him, Donna admitted. I found out that day and rushed home to make my fiance happy. But the surprise didn't work. He brought his mistress to my apartment. The woman was still surprised by her fiance's insolence. A banal story. But it always seems to happen only in the movies or somewhere far away. But not to you. Donna summed up her story. And the baby? Louise asked. Was it born? Yes, of course it was. I had a healthy, beautiful boy at the due date. And I named him Austin. Where is he now? He's on an internship in America. He should be back soon. I admire you, Donna. Louise said with emotion, you're so strong. You made your own business. You raised your son alone, gave him a good education. Yes, I did everything for him, the woman confirmed. I felt guilty that I had deprived him of communication with his father. So I tried to fill the gap in every way I could. If clothes, shoes, then the best, branded, vacation only abroad, education European. In short, I worked day and night to provide my boy with the best. He must love you very much and appreciate everything you do for him. Louise's question remained unanswered. Donna abruptly changed the subject, remembering that she had a business appointment. Louise and her sister spent the whole weekend at Donna's house. At her mistress' request, she cleaned the room several times, especially the one for the young master. Finally, exhausted, the housekeeper said, Donna, the whole house is already shining. Don't you think you've done enough cleaning? After a second look in all the most secret corners, she agreed. All right, it looks clean, she said, and then added, Austin doesn't like the house to be dusty or cluttered. Early the next week, the mother was looking forward to her son's arrival. You don't have to come tomorrow, she told Louise the day before. Austin and I will need some alone time. It's been so long since we've seen each other. The housekeeper nodded and said goodbye. The next day after school, Louise hurried to the daycare center to pick up her sister early. The weather was overcast. It had been raining since the morning. In the afternoon, the rain stopped, but the humidity and strong wind were pervasive. Louise was standing at the bus stop waiting for the bus when a car stopped nearby. A young man got out of the car and, ignoring the people around him, headed toward the flower store behind the bus stop. Louise looked at the stranger at the door and suddenly caught herself thinking, Lucky the girl he's going to marry will be lucky. Without realizing what it was about him that attracted her attention, she noted his confident gait, his noble bearing, his attractive appearance, and the trail of expensive cologne that followed him drove her crazy. The young man came out of the store with a gorgeous bouquet of flowers. The thought flashed through Louise's mind again. Who is the lucky girl to whom these flowers are intended? The stranger got into the car and drove off briskly. Louise, who was standing next to him, was wet and dirty from the splashing from the wheels. The car sped away, and the girl stood there, almost crying, trying to clean herself up. The first pleasant impression, which at first left a young man, was spoiled. The next morning Louise came to work. To her surprise, Donna was in no hurry to go anywhere. She was sitting on the living room couch drinking coffee, the aroma of which wafted throughout the house, saying hello to her hostess. The girl asked in surprise, Are you alone? And where is your son? He is still asleep, answered the woman and took a sip of the fragrant drink. You don't have to go up to the second floor today. 
wiped the dust in the living room and washed the dishes left over from last night's dinner. Louise went to the dining room. She was surprised to see on the table the same bouquet of flowers that had been brought from the store by the stranger who had doused her from the puddle the day before. While the housekeeper washed the dishes, the young master went down to the living room. Turning off the water, Louise found herself an unwilling witness to part of the conversation between mother and son. This is my life, said the young man, and it is for me to decide how and with whom to spend it. I think I have the right to express my opinion on this. Came Donna's voice. It seems to you, answered the son and went to the dining room. When he crossed the threshold, the young man stood up in surprise. It was the stranger with the bouquet. And who are you? He asked not very kindly. Louise, she introduced herself. I am the housekeeper. Hey, I see, he said with what she thought was a twinge of squeamishness and went into the refrigerator. Can you make an omelet? I do, only it's not. Louise wanted to say that cooking was not her job. She preferred to cook her own food. But the young man did not want to hear her out. Apparently, it was not in his habits. Then make it quick, he said. I don't have much time. Louise didn't want to spoil her relationship with the landlady's son, so she took out a frying pan and began to fry an omelette. She often made this dish for breakfast in the mornings, so that it was as good as a professional cook. Mmm, it's been a long time since I've had an omelette like that, said Austin. You surprise me. Thank you. Louise realized that she was pleased with Austin's praise. At that moment, Donna entered the dining room. Now she was in full dress, as always. I see you two have met, she said. Thank you, Louise, for breakfast. You can be free. But don't forget to dust the living room. After finishing her work, the girl walked along the road towards the institute and replayed in her head the events of the last two days. Something was wrong with Donna and Austin's relationship. For all his external attractiveness, there was something repulsive in the young man's behavior. On the one hand, that gorgeous bouquet for his mother, and at the same time, the rude conversation with her in the morning. Louise remembered with what impatience Donna waited for her son, and now they behaved as if they were strangers to each other. She couldn't stop asking herself, why did Austin have such an attitude toward the closest person to her? What could she have done to displease him? And what were they arguing about in the living room? A familiar voice interrupted her thought process. Louise turned her head and saw Austin sitting behind the wheel of the very car that had doused her the day before. He was smiling with his mouth full of white teeth like a Hollywood actor. While Louise was gathering her thoughts, the young man repeated his question. How far are you going? I can give you a ride. No, thank you, she replied. I'm almost there. Well, as you wish, Austin said with a shrug of his shoulders and drove off sharply. One day Louise came in when Donna was no longer home. After cleaning up, the girl was about to leave, but Austin stopped her. Are you leaving already? He asked. I was going to ask you to clean my room. Louise took a vacuum cleaner, a rag, a bucket of water and went up to the second floor. All the time she was skillfully operating the vacuum cleaner. Austin stood in the doorway and watched the cleaning. At one point Louise fell out of place. Is something wrong? She asked. No, no, it's great. I love watching other people work. Have you tried getting a job? Austin didn't like Louise's question. He wrinkled his nose and concluded, you're impertinent, and then added, clearly wanting to put her in her place. But what can you take from a housekeeper? You've hardly been taught manners. I see you didn't go to etiquette school either, Louise suggested in the same tone. If you'll allow me, I'll take over. Of course, the money has to be paid, Austin said and left the room. Having finished cleaning, Louise went downstairs. Austin was lying on the sofa in the living room. When he saw the housekeeper, he stood up and looked at her from head to toe and asked, Is it over already? So soon? Check it out. If there's anything wrong, I'll fix it. With a hum, the young man went upstairs. After a minute, he looked out of his room and said, That'll do for the first time. Thank you and that's it. Louisa replied and headed for the exit. Why did your mother take you? He said to her. You're always in a hurry. What if I need a housekeeper tonight? Donna is quite satisfied with my candidacy. The girl was not confused. You should hire someone else. You're too talkative. The young man said irritably. This is no way for a servant to behave. And you find yourself a deaf mute. 
she will not hear your rudeness and will not cross you. Louisa replied and disappeared behind the door. Austin shook his head unhappily and went back to his room. He wasn't used to being spoken to like this. Usually girls looked him in the mouth, trying to please the enviable beau. But now some housekeeper had taken the liberty of speaking to him disrespectfully. It really hurt the young man. And at the same time, Austin was impressed by Louise's boldness and sharp wit. The next day, the young master got up early. Louise caught him in the kitchen as he rummaged in the refrigerator. Donna was finishing her coffee and giving her son advice on what to eat for breakfast. Maybe our housekeeper could make me something, Austin suggested, looking at Louisa. The girl looked at him, then at her hostess. Catching her questioning look, Donna said, Louisa, if it's not too much trouble for you, feed my hungry son. At the end of the month, I'll recalculate your paycheck. The housekeeper quickly threw on an apron and started preparing breakfast. Meanwhile, the housekeeper said goodbye to the household and left for work. While Austin devoured all this cheesecakes, she began to clean up. Wiping the dust in the office, the girl felt a stare. Turning around, she saw Austin standing on the doorstep, watching her every move. Did you need something? She asked. I wanted to thank you for the cheesecakes, he said. I'm glad you liked them. The girl wanted to continue her work, but she noticed that Austin was not leaving. Anything else? She asked. You're feeding me breakfast, the young man replied. Let me take you to lunch. Thanks, but I eat lunch at the institute in the cafeteria. I see. Where do you get the money for restaurants? But don't worry. If I invite you, I pay. You're an amazing man, she said, apparently wanting to thank you. You managed to offend. I do not need your restaurants. I trust the canteen at the institute more. Come on, don't pout. Austin tried to reconcile. I don't understand your stubbornness either. You're invited to a restaurant and you refuse. Aren't you used to rejection? Louise suggested. Usually girls jump to the ceiling when I ask them to spend time with me, Austin admitted. I've had enough of your company here, she retorted, and your ceilings are high. I can't jump, so I'm not going to try. Okay, we don't have time for lunch, so why don't we have dinner tonight? If you don't want to go to a restaurant, let's go to a cafe or a canteen. He said and grinned. Maybe I'll like it there too. I don't think so, Louisa replied. Dine with your sportswoman where you're used to. I'll make do with homemade cutlets. Well, as you like, said Austin, not hiding his displeasure. But if you change your mind, let me know. My offer still stands. Are you in a hurry again? Austin asked when Louise was about to leave. Should my room be cleaned? You were asleep. I didn't want to wake you, she replied. I have to go to the institute. If you can't wait until tomorrow to clean, I can come back after school. Do me a favor. After class, Louisa went to work. Donna wasn't home yet, but Austin welcomed her with open arms. I thought you weren't coming. Ignoring her young master's nighting, Louise changed into her work clothes and headed upstairs. What was her surprise when she entered Austin's room? Orderly and clean, everything was in its proper place. The surprised housekeeper turned to the young man who had followed her and asked, Did you clean it yourself? Do you think I can't even tidy my own room? He answered her question with a question. I didn't say that, Louise remarked. Then why did you have to invite me? It's a good thing the Institute is within walking distance of your house. Otherwise, you wouldn't be lured to dinner, Austin explained. What dinner? She asked, not hiding her annoyance. I have to go to kindergarten. My child is waiting for me, and I'm going to have dinner here. While Austin was digesting what the housekeeper had said, Louise went downstairs, changed her clothes, and headed out. She was stopped at the door by the young master. So you have a child? And you're breaking like a girl, he said and grabbed her arm and pulled her to him. Louise didn't have time to realize what was happening when Austin pressed her against the wall and started kissing her. The girl tried to resist, but the forces were unequal. With one hand the guy held her arms, and the other was already getting under her skirt. Let me go, Louise demanded. I'll tell Don everything, and I'll tell her that you attacked me, Austin replied with a sneer in his voice. Who is she going to believe, her son or some cleaning lady? Let me go, she said, trying to get away. Don't you have enough groupies? What do you need me for? The girl's fierce resistance made the young man even more eager. His kisses became more and more demanding, and his hands roamed all over her body. 
In one motion, Austin pulled Louise down onto the couch and began to undo the buttons of her blouse. There are a lot of admirers, but they get boring, he admitted in a burst of passion. They're just a whistle away, and you're not like that. Then let me go, Louisa begged. I don't want to be like this. Austin had no time to say anything when his mother's voice came from behind him. What's going on here? She asked menacingly. Austin jumped up from the sofa like a scalded man and said, smoothing his hair and clothes with his hands. I didn't hear you come in. I noticed Donna Perry. So what's going on here? Louise rose to follow Austin. Burning with shame, she hid her eyes and tried to tidy her clothes. Excuse me, Donna, the housekeeper said in a low voice. She wanted to explain the situation, but Austin interrupted her. Mom, we're adults to answer to you, he said. It seemed to me that Louise did not enjoy your caresses. You imagined it, replied the young man. No, I didn't. Louisa interrupted him. I'm sorry, Donna, but I'm not going to work in your house anymore. I took a job as a housekeeper. It's not my job to please your son. You have nothing to apologize to me for, said the landlady. I'm the one who needs to apologize to you. Go home. We'll talk tomorrow. Louise grabbed her bag and quickly ran out of the house. She wanted to forget this nightmare as quickly as possible, but the scent of Austin's expensive cologne followed her all the way home. It wasn't until she took a shower that she was able to get rid of the intrusive scent. The next morning, Donna called Louise herself and asked her to come to her house. Austin wouldn't be there, she warned, but we need to talk. Half an hour later, Louise was already at Donna's house. Don't be angry with my son, she asked. He thinks money can buy everything and everyone. It's probably my fault. Like any loving mother, I always wanted the best for him. So I worked 20 hours a day. Austin was left to his own devices. When he was little, he had a nanny, but when he grew up and became independent, that's when the problem started. As is often the case when parents are very busy, the teenager got involved with a bad company, fell in love with the girl who at that time was already on the record in the police. The boy, who for seven years of schooling had shown great promise, seemed to be replaced. He became rude, left home, skipped lessons at school. Persuasion and pleas didn't work. In order to pull them out of this company, I had to change my place of residence and the school my son attended. Austin was very worried about parting with this girl, blamed me for all the deadly sins. For a few years, our relationship was very strained, but gradually my son got his head on straight. He graduated from school with a silver medal and entered the institute. Everything seemed to be back to normal, but the spoiled relationship with my son never fully recovered. In his eyes, I remained forever busy mom, who first deprived him of his father and then his favorite girl. But it's been so long. Louise couldn't contain her emotions. Your Austin is a grown man. He's only grown up, Donna replied, but in his heart, he's still a hurt little child who takes revenge for his wrongs whenever he gets the chance. But you said he was on an internship, Louise recalled. Yes, Austin had graduated with honors and had been offered a position with a well-known company, but he had to do an internship first. I hoped that being away from me would change him, and I thought it would, but yesterday, I caught you. It wasn't my fault, Louise said. I was about to leave, but I believe you. The landlady interrupted her. You don't have to justify yourself to me. I thought my son liked you, and I hoped that you and he could have a relationship, but I guess I was wrong again. I don't think I'm the right girl for him, Louise said. We have different attitudes to life and people. Maybe, agreed Donna but I still want to ask you not to leave my house. I've grown attached to you, and it's hard to find decent, honest people like you these days. After a short pause, Louise shook her head and said, No, Donna, I'm sorry, but I don't want to see your son again. I thought so, the woman admitted, and taking an envelope with a few bills from her dresser drawer, handed it to the housekeeper. This is your paycheck. Thank you for your work, but you should think about it. Maybe you'll change your mind. A few days passed after Louise was fired from Donna's house. During the time she'd been working, she'd been able to put aside some money, which now came in handy. The allowance from the state was also a good help. Not to say that the sisters did not need anything, but they were not poor either. Louise's main concern was that the guardianship authorities would not come to check on them. Louise, will they take me back to the orphanage? Marta asked her sister every now and then. No. 
They won't lose the answer. I'll find another job soon. But in a pinch, I'll go to Donna. She promised to help. It's a shame you don't work for Aunt Donna anymore. I liked her, Martha confided to her sister on the walk. I liked her too, agreed Louise. But unfortunately, we can't always do what we want to do. Why don't we visit her? Martha suggested it. She won't kick us out, will she? She won't, confirmed her big sister. But let's do it some other time. Why some other time? Suddenly, a man's voice came from behind the sisters sitting on the bench. My man will be glad to see you. The girls turned around. Austin was standing behind them with a the bouquet in his hands. Hearing the familiar voice, Louise flinched. All these days, she had been trying to forget about the incident, and she certainly hadn't expected to see him in the yard of her own house. Who are you? Martha inquired. The young man walked around the bench and squatted down in front of the girl extended his hand to her and introduced himself. Uncle Austin, what's your name? Martha, she answered cheerfully and pointing to the flowers asked, and who are these for? Your mom, the man said and handed the bouquet to Louise. My mom is dead and Louise is my sister, the girl explained. Martha's words confused Austin. I'm sorry, he turned to Martha. I didn't know. What are you doing here? Louise asked making it clear that she was not happy to see him. I came to apologize for my behavior. I don't know what came over me. Take these flowers as a token of reconciliation. I forgive you, but I won't take the flowers, Louisa replied and went home. Louisa, I was going to ask you to come back to work. No, I promise to behave. I'm not sure you know anything about decorum. Everybody can make mistakes, Austin said in his defense, but you have to be able to forgive. I said I forgave you, the girl reminded him, but I'm not going to work for you anymore. What can I do to make you change your mind? Why such persistence? I'm sure there will be a lot of people willing to take my place. By the way, maybe they'll be more cooperative. Austin, who was not accustomed to long persuasion, could hardly contain his irritation. I wouldn't have insisted if it hadn't been for my mother, he admitted. She's been giving me a hard time. How did you win her over? Louise is the best. Martha stood up for her sister. The young man looked at the girl and then back at the former housekeeper. Think it over, he said. We won't hurt your wages. Putting the bouquet on the bench, Austin walked quickly to the car. In a minute, he was already behind the house. Martha looked at him and said, What a nasty uncle. Did you leave Aunt Donna because of him? Yes, she admitted. I didn't like him at first either. It's a shame you don't work there anymore, Martha said on the way home. The sisters never returned to the subject again, but it didn't take Austin long. A couple of days later, he met Louise after school. Are you following me? She asked irritably. Finally, you stopped yelling at me, the young man remarked. I think we're even closer now. Why did you come here? Louise repeated the question. I wanted to see if you had changed your mind. No, that's a pity. Mam is having a hard time, Austin paused, as if waiting for a clarifying question, but when he didn't, he continued. I was hoping your return would get her back on her feet quickly. What does that mean? Louise didn't understand. Didn't I say? Mom had stumbled on the porch and fell and broke her leg. Now she's sitting at home, telling me every minute how bad I am. Why didn't you tell me this before? The girl got worried. Are you driving? We're in the car. Austin replied with a smirk. Will you even get in my car? If you don't mind, Louise said and followed him. Austin turned the key in the ignition and pressed the gas pedal. The car squealed and sped forward like a rocket. Louise's breath caught in her throat. Don't be afraid. I'll take you home like an airplane, the driver promised. The main thing is not to take off early, she replied, holding tightly to the handle. And you with humor, noted the young man and grinned. Soon the car pulled up outside Donna's house. Austin got out of the car and called out to his mother, but no one answered. Stepping over the threshold of the house, he shouted, My man, look who I brought you. Louise appeared at the door. She immediately saw the owner sitting on the sofa in the living room with a plastered leg. Donna was overjoyed to see her guest. What a surprise, she exclaimed. Unexpected, but very pleasant. Have you changed your mind and decided to come back? Come in. Well, why are you standing on the doorstep like a stranger? Donna was genuinely happy to see Louisa. 
She didn't know where to sit her or what to serve her. Well, you two talk, Austin said, going upstairs. When you go home, he said to Louise, call me. I'll drag you. Thank you, she replied, but I know the way. I'll try myself. As you wish. The landlady and the former housekeeper sat over a cup of tea and talked like good old friends. Donna was interested in the girl's studies, her plans for the future, asked about her younger sister, and did not fail to complain about the accident that had happened to her two days ago. But most of the time the woman talked about her son. I think Austin has begun to grow up, she admitted. He is changing in front of my eyes. He stopped being rude, became more restrained and patient, helps me around the house. And most importantly, he went to work. It's about time he got his head on straight. Yes, Don agreed. But I think you can take credit for that. Me? Louise was surprised. You're exaggerating. I haven't worked for you for half a month. It was after you left that I started to notice a change in my son. Maybe he's fallen in love with you. Don, don't make this up. I'm just a servant for your son, a cleaning lady. Men like him don't even look at men like me. And frankly, I'm not crazy about Austin. You should look at him though, mom said. He's not bad at heart. Austin was great when he was a kid. If it hadn't been for his exposure to bad company. I understand, Louise interrupted her. Like a loving mother, you idealize your child. But Austin's grown up now and he has to take responsibility for his actions. You're right, Louise. You're absolutely right, but everyone can make mistakes. Give him a chance. I see the way he looks at you. You're not like the rest of his girlfriends, mercantile, glossy, capricious dolls who are used to having fun and doing nothing. You're real. You're just like me when I was young. That's probably why I'm so attached to you. I am flattered to hear you say that, Lusa replied, but don't try to set me up with your son. I am not sure that we both need it. The conversation was interrupted by the sudden appearance of Austin. Glancing at the clock on the wall, he asked the guest, aren't you going to be late for kindergarten? Louise jumped up like a scalded woman. Oh, I've forgotten all about the time, she confessed. Don, get well. I'll visit you again, with your permission. Or maybe you can come back to us at least for a while, the landlady asked, until I get better. Louise was taken by surprise by her landlady's request. She didn't want to see Austin every day, but she couldn't say no to someone in need. Okay, I'll go to work tomorrow, she promised and headed for the exit. Can I give you a ride after all? Austin asked. I'm going your way. I won't bother you. He promised and grinned. Come on, Louise. Donna joined in. You'll have a long ride on public transportation and the daycare center will be closed by then. All right, she said and followed Austin. Almost the whole way, the young people drove in silence. Stopping near the garden, Austin suddenly asked, I do not understand why you have taken on all this trouble. You yourself are not yet firmly on your feet, and then there is your sister. Where am I supposed to put her? Louise asked. Well, there are boarding schools, orphanages, he began to enumerate. I have no doubt that if you were in my place, you would have done the same thing. I love my sister. But you probably don't understand that. She was about to get out of the car, but Austin stopped her. Why are you making a monster of me? I thought I already apologized for my behavior. I just wanted to say that it's hard to carry a baby on your own, especially in your situation. Yes, Louise agreed. It's a difficult position to be in. But Martha's my sister and I'm the only one she's got. She has no one else to rely on. I will never abandon or betray her. That is commendable, said Austin with his usual grin. You decided to put your youth on her, and then she'll grow up and won't thank you for it. You shouldn't judge people by themselves. Not everyone grows up ungrateful, Louise retorted. I don't do it for thanks. Perhaps I need it more than she does, but you don't understand that. Louise got out of the car and headed for the kindergarten. Austin stared after her until she disappeared around the corner. The housekeeper's words had hurt his ego. He hated to hear that he was an ungrateful, insensitive man. But she was right about something. Pressing the gas pedal, he drove off briskly and quickly disappeared. All the way he pondered Louise's words and analyzed his life. So far, everything had suited him. Austin considered himself a reasonably intelligent, educated, well-bred man. He was in demand with the opposite sex and authority among friends. He was used to people looking at his mouth and fawning over him. And here's some girl who knew nothing about his life. 
constantly wiping his nose. On the one hand, he found himself thinking that he liked Louise. Unlike the others, she did not ingratiate herself with him. On the contrary, she openly expressed her opinion. But at the same time, that was what annoyed him about her. Sometimes Austin felt that his mother's housekeeper thought too much of herself. The man, engrossed in his thoughts, did not notice that he had reached the house. Once inside, he saw that his mother was still sitting in the same place. At some point, the man felt his heart squeeze. Mom, do you need help? He asked. Donna flinched in surprise. No, she said, and then suddenly added, this is the first time you've called me mom in a long time. I've been mom and mother to you for a long time. Did something happen? No, Austin answered. I just suddenly realized that I have no one else but you. Tears glistened in the woman's eyes. Austin, pretending not to notice, went quickly upstairs and hid in his room. The next day, Louise arrived at Donna's house as promised. Austin wasn't home, but his mother wouldn't stop talking about him. You know, Austin's changed a lot since he met you. I think you're having a very positive effect on him, she shared with the housekeeper. Don't exaggerate, Donna, the girl asked. I don't take any credit for it. It's just that people change. Your son must have realized that you are the closest and dearest person to him. Having finished cleaning, Louisa said goodbye to the landlady and went to the institute. After class, she got an unexpected surprise. Austin met her on the way to the bus stop. He was holding a small but beautiful bouquet. Hi, these are for you, he said and handed them to Louise. At times like this, Louise felt awkward. She still didn't trust Austin. It seemed to her that a man could not have changed so dramatically in such a short time. It's unnecessary, she said. Looking at the flowers. Why did you come here? First of all, the flowers are a thank you for my mother. Thank you for helping her. Second, stop yelling at me. I'm only five years older than you. You don't have to thank me for something I do with heart and pleasure, especially not for free. Give those flowers to Donna. You again? Austin looked at the girl reproachfully. I will stop howling if you promise not to come to my institute with flowers anymore, she said. I don't want my classmates to start gossiping about me. What's wrong with a girl's boyfriend coming to pick her up? He asked. You're not my boyfriend. Louise reminded him. All right, agreed the young man. I promise not to compromise you again. Just take this bouquet. Louise sighed and took the flowers. I can give you a ride to the garden, Austin offered. It's not worth it. I'd rather take the bus. It's safer that way. Austin grinned his trademark smile and replied, I promise to drive slowly and deliver it safely on time. Okay, Louise gave in, one last time. The young man headed towards Austin's automobile. To the girl's surprise, he was as gallant and attentive as ever. Ahead of her by a few steps, the man opened the door in front of the passenger and kindly offered her his hand. It did not go unnoticed by Louise that this time Austin drove the car slowly and carefully. At some point, it seemed to her that there was a completely different person beside her. Not so long ago, the arrogant snob had magically transformed himself into a well-mannered, intelligent man, pleasant in every way. On the one hand, Louise liked this change in him. On the other hand, it frightened her, something fake about it. What are you thinking about? Austin asked noticing the passenger's absent gaze out the window. About how a man can change in a few days, replied Louise. Are you referring to me? He clarified. Yes, I don't believe in such metamorphosis, she admitted. You're obviously up to something. I just don't know what it is. You're wrong. The young man tried to persuade her. It was my behavior before that was fake. I'm used to acting like that, he admitted. Women like confident, persistent, goal-oriented men. Confident but not cocky, Louise corrected him, persistent but not insolent, determined but not pushy. So you think I'm a pushy, self-assured, impudent man? Austin concluded, yes. Louise's answer discouraged him. He was still unaccustomed to her honesty and directness, and at the same time, it turned him on. No woman had so far stirred his mind as Louise had. Her behavior aroused mixed feelings in him. On the one hand, he was magnetically drawn to her. On the other, he wanted to punish her for her unapproachability and intransigence. Here we are, Austin announced, stopping outside the nursery. I'll wait for you here. No need. It's just a short walk from here to our house. 
will walk with Martha. I don't mean to be intrusive, the man said, mindful of the conversation, but could I keep you company? Louise shrugged her shoulders and headed toward the kindergarten. Her sister ran out to meet her. Noticing Austin behind her, she asked in her ear, what's he doing here? We met by chance, Louise explained in a whisper and he offered me a ride. Did he also give you flowers by chance? She asked in a whisper and then she said, I don't like him anyway, even with flowers. After walking the sisters to the entrance, Austin suddenly suggested, maybe on the weekend we can walk in the park or go to the zoo together. No, Martha replied firmly. We had other plans. Louise was used to her younger sister's development and Austin was discouraged by the little girl's answer. But quickly gathering his thoughts, he asked, do you have dolls? Lots, Martha replied. Do they have their own dollhouse? After a short pause, the girl said, no, they live in my and Luis's house. But everyone should have their own house, Austin insisted. Would you like us to buy your dolls a house too? The pause dragged on. Martha could feel the thought process going on in her head. Like any girl, she wanted a dollhouse, but she still didn't trust Austin. Realizing the reason for the silence, the man turned to Louise. Do you mind if I give your sister a gift as a sign of reconciliation? I'm not sure it's right or necessary. Let's skip the expensive gifts. I'm about to get my first paycheck, the man said. I'd like to spend it on something nice. Louise wanted to reply, but Austin beat her to it, adding, I promise I won't neglect my mom. But that was unnecessary, she insisted. Thank you for the ride and for seeing her off, she said, and taking her sister's hand in hers, she disappeared down the driveway. On the morning of the day off, the girls were in no hurry. They had no special plans, so they lay in their beds and talked. Suddenly, the doorbell rang. Jumping up like a scalded woman, Louise ran to the bathroom, shouting on the way. Who? It's me, Austin, came a voice from outside the door. Wait, commanded the girl and disappeared into the bathroom. Martha had made her bed in her sister's, and after glancing around the room and making sure everything was in order, she opened the door. The man was holding a huge box. As he crossed the threshold, he set it on the floor and said to Martha, This is for you. Unpack it. The girl looked from the giver to the gift with disbelief. She guessed what was in the box, but did not dare to open it without her sister's permission. Don't be shy, Austin urged her. I promised you a doll's house, didn't I? take it. I'm not going to carry this weight back, am I? Martha's last argument seemed reasonable, and she began to remove the wrapping. After a hasty shower, Louise came out of the bathroom wrapped in a towel. She hadn't expected to see Austin here, so she froze in surprise for a few seconds and then disappeared out the door again. That was enough time for the man to get a glimpse of the housekeeper's chiseled figure. Her smooth legs, graceful arms, straight posture, slim waist, and narrow shoulders were as if chiseled by a talented craftsman. In such a way, Louise stirred Austin's imagination even more. In his mind, he was already imagining her in his arms. He had never wanted a woman so badly in his life. A moment later, Louise came out in the robe she had to get out of the laundry basket. But even in her crumpled housecoat, she looked very attractive and desirable. I told you not to open the door to strangers, she reproached her sister. But he's not a stranger. Martha replied, taking the doll's house out of its wrapping. What the hell is this? Her older sister asked sternly, looking at the toy. Now my dolls will have their own house, the girl said happily. It's too expensive, Louisa said. We can't accept it. Martha, engrossed in the toy, did not even react to her sister's words. But I'm not going to take it back to the store, Austin replied. They won't take it back without its wrapping. Look how happy your sister is. Can't you take it away from her? Then I'll give you the money from my paycheck, Louisa suggested. I will not take money from you, replied the young man. But if you have extra, you can take me to the movies. All right, she agreed. But first, we need breakfast. While Louise made pancakes, Austin helped Martha set up the dollhouse. From the outside, they all looked like a close-knit family. Despite her distrust of the hostess's son, Louise watched her sister and the guests play with amusement. For a moment, she thought that he was indeed a kind and decent man. And the incident of molestation in the drawing room was only a misunderstanding, which Austin had long since repented of. 
The pancakes are wonderful. Praise the hostess. You haven't tasted Louise's cakes yet. Martha added with pride in her voice. Martha, you have to address adults as you. Her sister corrected her. Uncle Austin told me to call him you, she said. Louise looked questioningly at the guest. Austin, as if nothing had happened, said, Why the ceremony? I think it's easier to communicate this way. After breakfast, Austin, Louise and Martha went to the biggest shopping and entertainment center in the city. There was everything there. A movie theater, a cafe, a restaurant, a playground. Yes, sorry, I'm sorry, Austin replied, getting up from his seat. Time flies with you. Why don't we all go out again sometime? Maybe. Austin stood on the doorstep and looked at Louise. He wanted to kiss her desperately, but he was afraid of ruining the relationship he had just established. Shuffling from foot to foot like a schoolboy, he decided to ask, Can I kiss you? Instantly, the girl's cheeks flushed. She wanted to say no, but her tongue wouldn't listen to her. A second pause, and Louise felt Austin's moist lips on hers. Without wanting to, the girl reached for him. She wrapped her arms around his neck. Austin put his arms around her waist and pulled her to him. This kiss, filled with tenderness and affection, was nothing like that first kiss. Louise felt herself starting to lose control of herself and the situation. But suddenly Austin pulled her away from him just as gently and said, See you soon. Donna was on the mend quickly. Louise came to her house every day and cleaned her house. She also had to cook meals now. It was good that the vacations had started and the housekeeper had a lot of free time. Martha became a frequent visitor to Donna's house, who was happy to spend time with her while Louise did her chores. Austin rushed home every day after work to spend time with Louise. Donna noticed her son's rapprochement with the housekeeper and did not hide her joy about it. I think Austin has seriously fallen in love with you, she once shared with Louise. It's like he's been replaced. It's true what they say. Love works wonders. Louise only smiled at these words and lowered her eyes in embarrassment. She too saw this change, which made her look at the man with different eyes. She felt that she was falling more and more in love with him every day. Alone with Austin, her heart was racing as if it was trying to jump out. Only a little worm in her head kept her mind on her own. It was like it was drilling at the same place, not allowing her to relax and forget. Martha, in spite of her young age, was thinking naturally. Uncle Austin may be a good man, but he's not for you, she told her sister privately. You're different. You seem to like him, don't you? Louise asked. Yes, she confirmed, but he's not real, he's too perfect. When Donna's cast was removed, she was offered to go to a local sanatorium for rehabilitation. Without much thought, the woman agreed, taking a promise from Louisa that she would take care of the house during her absence. Maybe Marta could come with me, the landlady suggested it. It would be a nice change of scenery for the girl, and I wouldn't be bored. Martha gladly agreed to Aunt Donna's suggestion, and two days later they left for the sanatorium together. That same evening Austin arranged a romantic candlelight dinner for Louise. Of course, the dinner was prepared by Louise, but while she was busy in the kitchen, he set the table in the living room, dimmed the lights, lit candles, and put on some nice music. What a surprise. The girl was surprised. Like in the best houses of Paris. Why Paris? We're not the best either. I noticed. Demonstratively pushing back his chair, the young man invited Louise to the table. Playing along with him, the girl, lifting her skirt slightly, walked solemnly to the chair and sat down. Austin unsealed a bottle of red wine and filled the glasses. I propose a toast to us, he said. Taking a sip, Louise put the glass back, but Austin made the toast again and again. Even a dense dinner did not relieve the girl, who was not used to alcoholic drinks, from a slight dizziness. Maybe we should dance, Austin suggested, and taking Louise by the hand, led her to the center of the living room. To the quiet, peaceful sounds of music, the young people slowly twirled in a dance. Despite her outward calmness, Louise's insides were trembling. Every touch of Austin stirred her, her heart periodically tried to jump out of her chest. The wine and the ever-present scent of Austin's cologne were intoxicating. At some point, Louise's legs felt cotton and her eyelids felt heavy. She rested her head on her bow's shoulder and felt his muscles tense. At the same moment, he picked her up in his arms and carried her to his room. 
What are you doing? Louise asked. Don't say anything. Austin asked in a whisper. Going up to the room, he put her on the bed and laid down next to her. Feeling the girl's inner resistance, he kept her in his arms. I want you to be mine, he whispered and kissed her. This time his kiss was longer and more demanding than all the previous ones. Louise gasped with desire. That little worm that had been keeping her down until now had disappeared without a trace. She could no longer think or analyze what was happening. She just wanted to enjoy the moment. Louise gave free rein to her feelings and desires. The girl wrapped her two arms around the man's neck and whispered, yes. She didn't notice when Austin took off her clothes. In those rare moments of consciousness, Louise only noticed that he was gentle with her, then, like a wild animal, rushed at his prey. The pain and fear faded into the background as Austin whispered sweet words in her ear. Never before had she experienced such a flurry of feelings all at once. She felt like she was going to burst, but she didn't. Unable to contain herself any longer, she moaned. From time to time, her moans turned to screams and then back to silence. Soon, her inner trembling spilled outward. Louise was shaking as if from the cold. Her whole body was whimpering. It was not obeying her. Suddenly, Austin's rapid, rhythmic movements became slower until finally they stopped altogether. With a deep exhalation, the man collapsed beside her. Silence hung in the room. Louise's consciousness suddenly cleared. She slowly pulled the blanket over her, shamefully covering herself. Austin lay with his eyes closed and said nothing. Finally, after a few minutes, he got up and headed for the bathroom. Louise didn't know what she should do. On the one hand, she realized that nothing supernatural had happened between them. On the other hand, she was ashamed of her weakness. While she pondered, Austin showered and returned to her, wrapping his torso in a towel. Seeing the girl's embarrassment, he laid down next to her and asked, How are you feeling? Fine, she replied faintly. You really didn't have anyone before me, Austin said, as if still in doubt. I thought there were no more of them left nowadays. Louise said nothing but pulled the blanket tighter around her. I'm going to get some water, Austin said. Would you like some? The girl nodded and, after waiting for him to leave the room, headed for the bathroom. Standing under the shower, she could still feel Austin's touches and kisses on her body. The recent events flashed through her mind and his voice echoed in her ears. The warm water gradually brought Louise to her senses. Wrapping a large terry towel around herself, she stepped out of the bathroom. Austin was sprawled out on the bed on top of the blanket, looking at her intently. He had his trademark smirk on his face, which made her uncomfortable. But in the next second, Austin smiled and patting the vacant spot on the bed next to him, said affectionately, Come to my place, pretty girl. Louise crouched down next to him on the bed uncomplainingly. Austin put his arm around her shoulders and drew her to him and kissed her. You're hot, he said jokingly. I didn't expect you to be so passionate. Would you mind doing it again sometime? Donna and Martha had been at the sanitarium for two weeks. All that time she had been calling her son and the housekeeper periodically to tell them what she was doing and to ask about news from home. Austin went to work every day and Louise returned to her studies after a short rest. She was still doing chores, but now she often stayed overnight at Donna's house. Ever since Louise had become close to Austin, she had missed him. He was late from work for a good reason, or he had a meeting with friends, or he had to visit a sick boss. Soon Donna and Martha returned home. The girl had a lot of impressions. She told her sister about the wonderful time she had spent with Aunt Donna at the sanatorium. Louise was happy for her, but she couldn't hide her worries about the changes in her life from her hostess. Tell me what's going on with you and Austin, the woman asked when she was alone with the housekeeper. Everything is fine, Louise replied embarrassed by her question. You don't have to lie to me, Don asked. I was happy to learn that you had started a relationship with my son, but I don't see joy in your eyes. I'm glad, Louise said, but I think Austin's been spending less time with me. I think he's gotten colder. Don't make it up, Donna reassured her. It's just that men can't devote themselves to a woman completely. It's us women who dissolve into them when we fall in love. Louise continued to run the household at Austin's mother's house, but after her return, she no longer stayed overnight. Austin didn't insist. After seeing Louise home, he would go about his business and often return well past midnight. 
Donna did not like her son's late nights out, but she did not give him away, hoping that he would come to the senses and change. As time passed, however, nothing much changed. The woman noticed how sad her housekeeper was. She felt sorry for her, so she decided to intervene. Austin, we need to talk, she said sternly one day to her son, who was going to another meeting with his friends. Mother, not now, he asked her. The word mother cut Donna's hearing. Austin had been calling her mom lately, and she was insanely pleased with it. What had happened today? Why mom again? Did something happen to you? She asked. Trouble at work? No, everything's fine there. I'm still getting a tiny salary. The son replied in a disgruntled tone. I've offered you many times to go into business with me. The woman reminded him. I don't want my mother to be my boss, Austin said. When you're ready to retire, then call me. What's the matter with Louise? She asked me directly. What do you mean? Austin pretended not to understand. Don't pretend. Louise is a good girl. She'll make a fine wife. You're lucky she paid attention to you. What? She took notice of me. He interjected dismissively. She should be thanking the universe that a man like me came her way. At that time, the housekeeper had finished cleaning and was on her way to the living room to say goodbye to the owners. The conversation between mother and son made her stop outside the door. Louise had never allowed herself to eavesdrop on other people's conversations before. But this one concerned her directly, so she put her ear to the keyhole for a better hearing and froze. I'm sure she's grateful, her mother parried. You've been dating for months now. Where are you going to propose to her? What are you talking about, mom? I asked a normal question. When young people date, they make plans for the future. Are you thinking of marrying Louise? No, of course not. Austin grinned. Who am I? And who is she? Do you think I'm going to marry some housekeeper? She's only a housekeeper because of circumstances, the landlady said. But you know she's about to get her high school diploma, right? So what? Austin didn't give up. What difference does it make? She's a simpleton. I'm attracted to more interesting girls. With big boobs and empty heads. Dada got angry. I wish she was. There's no shame in going out with them. Austin, I had a better opinion of you, she admitted. I thought you were a smart, serious, forward-thinking man, and you still can't get over it. Mother, don't lecture me, he asked. I won't let you hurt Louise. The girl has been through enough in this life. I'm not going to hurt her, the man replied. Isn't that how it works? You meet and then you run away. Seeing that her son could not be persuaded, Donna bitterly waved her hand and left the living room. Frustrated, she headed for the stairs, not even noticing the housekeeper standing outside the door. Louise didn't move. Tears were streaming down her cheeks. She realized that Austin had deceived her. When she returned home, she cried into her pillow all night. The next morning, she woke up with a firm decision to sever all relations with the family in whose house she had worked for many months. Arriving at Donna's house, Louise made her way to the landlady's house. Austin had already left for work. Trying to hide the traces of her worries from the housekeeper, the landlady asked with a smile, How are you, Louise? How's Martha? Not wanting to beat around the bush, the girl said directly, Donna, I heard you talking to your son yesterday. You do realize that under these circumstances I can't continue to work in your house. Maybe things will change, she said with hope in her voice. Maybe Austin would come to the senses. You can't force a favor. Louise said firmly, and I don't like to talk to him and pretend that nothing has happened. Yes, I understand, agreed the landlady. You're probably right. I'm sorry about what happened. It wasn't your fault, Louise replied. You don't have to apologize to me for your son. He is a grown man and he can take responsibility for his own actions. Louise hadn't worked at Donna's house for several days. She was completely absorbed in her studies to get Austin out of her mind. Martha realized that something was going on with her sister, but she didn't ask her questions unless she got an answer. Donna, feeling guilty, didn't abandon the girls. She often came to visit them with gifts. The women tried not to bring up the subject of Austin, pretending that he did not exist. When Donna came to visit her sisters again, she said, Louise, I have an offer for you that you can't refuse. Intrigued, smiled the girl. I want to take you into my business, she informed me. In a few months, you'll get your diploma and you'll be looking for a job. I suggest you skip the job search and come to me for an internship right now. But I, 
I probably won't be able to do that, Louise said nervously. I don't understand anything about your business. What am I for? Donna asked cheerfully. I'll teach you everything. If you want to leave and work in your specialty, I won't hold you back. And if you like it, I promise you career advancement and a good salary. Say yes, Louise. Martha jumped up and down. After a moment's thought, Louise smiled and nodded in agreement. I'll do my best, she promised. Thank you. A few months flew by. All this time, Louise was writing her thesis and interning at Donna's company. The former owner, now director, was pleased with the new employee. Louise was a quick learner. She quickly joined the team and earned the respect of her colleagues. Now she devoted all her free time to herself and her little sister. Louise, knowing about her natural beauty nevertheless, following the advice of her boss, began to visit beauty salons, watch her appearance, updated her closet and enrolled in the gym. For a diamond to become a diamond, it needs a professional cut, Donna liked to say. And Louise had learned that. Young men looked at her and tried to ask her out every now and then. But Louise didn't have affairs at work. The memories of her failed relationship with Austin were still fresh in her mind. The girl was not ready to jump into the maelstrom again. One day, the director of the company came to work in a bad mood. Never before had she allowed herself to raise her voice at her subordinates, and on this day her shouting was heard from the very morning. Employees did not leave their workplaces, afraid to be seen by her. After gathering her courage, Louisa entered the principal's office and saw that the woman who had just raged was standing at the window, wiping tears from her face. Donna, is something wrong? Louisa ran up to her and asked, Can I help you? The principal didn't react to her words for a while, but then she turned, looked at the girl carefully and answered, Austin is going to get married. The news hit Louise like a blow to the head. All this time she had been trying in vain to forget Austin. She couldn't say that she still loved him, but his desire to marry someone else had hurt her feelings. Louise swallowed the lump in her throat and said as calmly as she could, it had to happen sometime. Maybe Austin will settle down now. I hoped until the last day that he'd come to his senses and come back to you, Donna admitted. I am flattered by your words, Louisa replied, but I don't think I could forgive him, so let him be happy with his girlfriend. The headmistress hugged the girl and smiled with sadness in her eyes. What a pity my son never realized what goal he had lost. From now on, Louisa spent a lot of time in the principal's office. Donna wanted to share her worries about the upcoming celebration with someone, and she found no better listener than Louise. The last thing she wanted to know was the details of the preparations for Austin's marriage, but she didn't dare to tell his mother, so she listened to her stories for hours. It was clear from Donna's remarks that she wasn't happy with her daughter-in-law. A narcissistic painted doll, she said of her, born with a golden spoon in her mouth and never took it out her whole life. Her father spoiled her, instilled in her that everything is bought and sold. And when he was gone, he died three years ago. His wife, a slacker, spent all his million dollar fortune on lovers. Now, with no one to help her, she decides to set up her daughter. What they don't know is that Austin's broken living off me. Why don't you tell them? Louise asked. Why should I? Jasmine comes to our house and talks to me for hours about her great love for my son. Why destroy such love? And Austin? Does he love her? I don't know. Sometimes I don't think he's capable of feeling that way at all. I've decided to stay out of his life. Let them live as they please. Finally, the day finally arrived. Despite Donna's pleas for a low-key wedding celebration, the young couple feasted on the world. Of course, it was not without the financial support of mothers. Donna immediately warned her son that the wedding and the wedding gift will be her last investment in him and the mother of the bride collected the remnants of the untold wealth of her deceased husband and gave them to her daughter's wedding on the condition that after marriage, she will return everything to her with more than enough. After the festivities, the newlyweds went on a wedding trip, which Donna gave them, and she herself returned to work. The director answered congratulations and questions from her subordinates dryly and reluctantly. One could sense that the woman was worried about her son's future, but she did not change her principles. He is a grown man, not stupid, with a good education, Louise reassured Austin's mother. He'll be fine. You'll laugh when you remember how you shed tears for nothing. How kind you are, Donna said, not hiding her admiration. 
God give you a good fiancé. He will, laughed the girl, all in good time. My man, I want to talk to you, said Austin on his return from the wedding trip. Let's talk, Donna agreed. Are you in some kind of trouble? No, no, the man was miffed. I just wanted to learn your business from the inside, so to speak. Well, this is unexpected. You've always been against the mother superior. Everything in this world is changeable, Austin replied philosophically. I changed my mind. Maybe you'll want to hand over your authority to me too, when you're convinced that I'm doing a good job with your enterprise. Austin and his young wife had returned from a wedding trip the day before. Being weary on the road, they went straight to their room, whence they did not come out all the evening. It was not until the next morning, while Jasmine was lying in bed, that Austin came into the parlor and had an unexpected conversation with his mother. Well, I don't mind, Donna said. My business is going to be lambasted by you anyway, so it's better to get into it beforehand. Where are you planning on going to work? Oh, we could do it today. I don't think I'll get into the process right away, so first I'll get to know the staff, get used to the office. Mother grinned and looked at her watch and said, Then you have 15 minutes. I don't like my employees to be late. I'll wait for you at the car. While Austin searched for a clean iron shirt, the time for packing was over. He kissed his sleeping wife at the last moment and got into the car with his mother, who had already left. I didn't even have time for breakfast, he complained. Why didn't your wife see you off? The woman asked. Jasmine is still asleep. Doesn't she have to go to work today? My man, what are you doing? Austin grinned. In her family, women don't work. Hours do, Donna retorted. Or does she think I'm going to feed and clothe her for the rest of her life? I will. Austin stood up for his lady. I'll be able to provide for my woman and then for my children. And what will your woman do? Home. A wife's duty is to keep the hearth and bear children. Donna looked at her son in silence and continued to follow the road. Soon they arrived at the factory. Austin walked in step with his mother, trying to establish himself as a strict boss in front of his subordinates from the first minutes. He had been to his parents' kingdom many times as a teenager, but then he had been here as a guest, and now he had come with the purpose of taking the throne. Practically nothing had changed here, Austin noticed just more employees. Yes, production is expanding, business is booming, Donna agreed. With the right management, it's a profitable business. We're here. Where? Austin didn't understand. Your office, if memory serves, is on the top floor. I thought I'd be sitting next to you. Sitting, my dear son, is not going to work, she replied. If you're here to work, you'll have to work hard. I'm used to being alone in my office. Here is your workplace. The director pointed to a vacant desk among the other desks where the employees were working. Austin glanced around the large workshop and looked at his mother with a puzzled look. You're not going to put me in the shop, are you? He asked. You wanted to get to know the production from the inside. She reminded him. When you master the technology, I will transfer you to the quality department. Mom, but I'm your son. Austin was indignant. You're my employee here. The director replied turned around and walked toward the stairs. If something is unclear, ask your colleagues. The man did not argue with his mother, deciding to continue the conversation in the evening at home. It was not until lunchtime that he managed to have breakfast and lunch. Sitting at the table with a bored look, he watched the workers. Suddenly his gaze stopped on a very elegant young woman. It was clear from her demeanor and mannerisms that she held not a small position in this enterprise. Mesmerized by her beauty and grace, Austin did not immediately recognize the well-groomed, blooming young woman as Louise. He had, of course, heard from his mother that she had invited her former housekeeper to join her at the company, but he had not expected to see such a change in her. There was not a trace of that simpleton left. She walked with a confident stride, responding to the greetings of the employees with a slight nod. Austin, as if mesmerized, did not take his eyes off her. The episodes of their date suddenly appeared in his mind. He remembered how he pursued her, and once he'd gotten her, he lost interest. It seemed to him that he even remembered the taste and smell of the food she cooked. Have you had lunch yet? Came his mother's voice from upstairs. Looking up, Austin saw his mother and nodded to her. She put the tray of food on the table and sat down across from her son. Have you changed your mind about working at my company? She asked. Austin looked at Louise and asked, Who does your housekeeper work here? You mean Louise? 
The woman clarified. She's my right-hand woman. I don't know how I managed without her. When I'm away, she runs the place. Wow, so some housekeeper is the boss and the director's son is just a laborer. Louise learned the manufacturing process from scratch, and she's a quick study, Donna said. If you try as hard as she did, you'll soon have your own office. Austin wasn't excited about the prospect. He'd assumed he'd be in charge right away, but he'd miscalculated. If it hadn't been for his wife, he would have left his mother that very day. But Jesmond insisted that it was time for him to take the whole business into his own hands, not to depend on his mother. So the man got up and headed into the shop to his workplace. Hello, dear. Met Jesmond, her husband, after the first day of work at the new place. How are you doing? Normal, Austin replied in a tired voice. What are we having for dinner tonight? I thought we were going out to a restaurant to celebrate your first day as boss. Jesmond, what restaurant? What boss? I don't think I've ever been as tired as I am today. What were you doing? The girl asked. Working. So we're not going to the restaurant, she said, stretching her lips. Well, what is it, mistress? Set the table. Donna, who had just entered the house, asked and went to her room. After changing her clothes, she went down to the dining room and seeing the empty table asked, Are we having dinner tonight? Mom, Jasmine suggested we celebrate my new assignment at the restaurant, Austin said. What's there to celebrate? The woman was surprised. When you become a boss, then we'll celebrate. Until then, I see no reason to celebrate. I do not understand, admitted Jasmine. And now you are what, if not the boss? And now your husband is an ordinary employee in the shop, explained his mother. A good boss is the one who rose to this post from below. The mother-in-law's answer dumbfounded her daughter-in-law. At first she stood with her mouth open and silently flapped her eyes, and then she grinned. My husband's a laborer? Yes, Donna confirmed. You can be proud of him. He's a hard worker. What have you been doing all day? I went to my mom's, and then I went to the beauty parlor with her. I just got back, said Jasmine. I'm really tired and hungry. Why don't we go to a restaurant after all? Austin looked at his mother, but she turned and went into the kitchen. Jasmine, he turned to his wife. I spent a lot of money on vacation. The paycheck isn't due for a while. If we go to the restaurant now, we'll be broke by the end of the month. What are you talking about? She asked with irritation in her voice. I married one of the richest men in town, and now you're telling me that we don't have any money. You know what kind of spending we've been doing for the last month, don't you? My card isn't unlimited. Ask your mother. She won't refuse her only son. I'm not sure that's a good idea, Austin replied. We're adults and we have to support ourselves. She doesn't have to support us. She's got a good job. Jasmine was indignant, referring to her mother-in-law. She earns so much money and lives with her son. When you were single, all right, someone had to look after you. But now that you're married, you might want to think about moving out. Where would she go? Austin asked. It's her house. Why does she need such a big house all by herself? We have a family, we'll have children. An apartment would be enough for her. At that moment, Donna appeared in the living room where the newlyweds were. Let's go to dinner, she called her son and daughter-in-law. Already sitting at the table, she warned Austin's wife. Don't think it's going to be like this every day. There's never been a slacker in this family. If you don't work, you better keep the house in order and cook dinner. I'm not your housekeeper or cook, snapped at Jasmine. I'm not going to ruin my manicure and hands by scrubbing your floors. Donna looked questioningly at her son, then at her daughter-in-law. What did you get married for? Donna asked. It is the husband's duty to provide for his wife. And what is the wife's duty? Austin's mother asked. The mother-in-law's question stumped Jasmine. She shifted her gaze from her husband to her mother-in-law and tried in vain to find the right words. Finally, the girl gathered her thoughts and answered, It is the wife's duty to bear and bring up children. Good, said Donna, and who will feed and wash them? There should be a housekeeper for that, reasoned Jasmine. In case you haven't noticed, we don't have a housekeeper, replied her mother-in-law. I've been doing the housework myself so far. I think I can still make myself a bowl of soup and iron a dress, but I won't take care of my son anymore. He has a wife now. If you hire a housekeeper, I won't mind, but you'll have to pay for it yourself. After dinner, Donna washed the dishes and went to her room, 
leaving the newlyweds alone. I don't think your mother likes me, Jasmine concluded. She's always trying to embarrass me in front of you. Don't make it up. Austin stood up for his mother. It's just that she wants to keep you busy. I see. I don't think we're going to get along in this house together. We should give her a hint about moving out. Why don't you talk to your mother? Talking to her wouldn't be a problem, Austin said. I just don't want you and me to have to look for an apartment. Long sleep, son, remarked Donna, putting on her jacket and heading for the exit. You're leaving already? Austin clarified. Aren't you going to wait for me? I warned you, I don't like it when employees are late, and I'm never late myself, her mother replied and disappeared out the door. Austin, disgruntled, wandered into the kitchen. The table was empty, and there was nothing in the refrigerator that looked like a cooked breakfast. Deciding to grab a snack on his way to work, he slammed the refrigerator door shut and went to his room. His spouse was sleeping like a baby. Austin looked in the closet and found no iron shirt. Jasmine, he called to his wife quietly. Iron my shirt. The girl only rolled over to the other side. Jasmine, he repeated louder. I have nothing to go to work in. The wife opened her eyes, stretched and replied with a smile. Then don't go. She reached out her arms to her husband and pulled him into bed, wrapping him in her arms. Austin didn't resist much. He liked it when Jasmine was gentle and affectionate with him. After lying in bed with his wife, Austin looked at his watch and realized that he was finally late for work. That's great, he said, getting out of bed, but mom won't like my absences. I could end up unemployed. Oh, come on. Jasmine grinned, grumbles, and will return. She won't kick out her only son. You don't know my mother well. You're just like a little delinquent child. Laughed Jasmine. Maybe we'd better go out. You've completely stopped taking me to restaurants. I explained everything to you. We have no money now. After these words, the girl became furious. I don't want to hear it. I married a millionaire and he turned out to be a starving man. Either you talk to your mother today and dot all the eyes and dot all the eyes, or Jasmine paused to think of the second option, or I'll have to do it. Austin didn't show up for work until lunchtime. The principal immediately called him into her office. It was clear from her stern look and stern tone that there was no good news. When she was alone with her son, she said, You asked to work for me. I kindly agreed, brought you to the Enterprise, explained all the procedures. But you decided they didn't concern you. If you change your mind, I won't hold you back. Just write your notice and go. Austin assumed that this was the format of their conversation, so he prepared himself morally. My man, he said to her in a calm voice, let's not be too hasty. I'm your only heir, so sooner or later you'll have to hand over the reins to me. Why all this circus with a simple laborer, then a foreman and so on? Everyone should be in their place. I didn't go to university so I can work as a laborer. If it weren't for these, as you say, simple laborers, you wouldn't be living in a huge house now and eating caviar sandwiches. Speaking of sandwiches, Austin caught on. I'm late today because I spent a long time making breakfast and ironing my shirt. Why doesn't your wife cook and iron for you? I thought you said the husband was the provider and the wife the keeper. Jasmine does not feel like a mistress in our house, complained Austin, and I can understand that. You can't have two mistresses in the same kitchen. I agree. So think about a separate place to live. That way, maybe your Jasmine will be a better hostess sooner. Austin realized that the conversation was not going the way he wanted it to, so he decided to leave. His mother stopped him on the doorstep. And think about the job. And for today's absenteeism, I will deduct from your salary. Only when he left the principal's office, Austin gave vent to his feelings. What a mother. When I was a kid, she was at work 24 hours a day, and now she's taking over my upbringing. It's too late for that. We'll see who will be the first to come begging for help. You're not getting any younger. He turned to her in his heart. And you're not taking your business with you. And when you're having a hard time coping, you'll call me yourself. Are you all right? A familiar voice pulled him out of his thoughts. Austin looked up and saw Louise in front of him. She was walking toward the principal with a stack of file folders. The girl looked at him as if he were a stranger. Not a single muscle on her face trembled. Austin even thought that she might not have recognized him. Louise? You look good. He perked up. How are you? Thank you. The girl replied calmly. I'm doing fine. And you? 
I thought you looked upset. You seemed upset. Well, okay. She shrugged her shoulders and continued on her way. Wait, Austin called out to her. Why don't we meet tonight? We can sit and talk. No, Louise said firmly. I don't date married men. And there's nothing to talk about. Without waiting for the former suitor's answer, the girl went to the principal's office. Austin stood and watched her. Miniature, as if chiseled by the hand of a master, elegantly dressed in expensive stiletto shoes, she walked down the corridor, swaying her hips. The young man could not take his eyes off her. As if mesmerized, he looked at her and remembered the nights he had spent with her. Pretty girl, on an exhalation said an unfamiliar male voice behind him. I can't take my eyes off her. Austin looked at the man in his work uniform with disdain and replied, nothing much, and to close the subject added, and you go where you're going. Married life was getting more and more stressful for Austin. This was not how he had envisioned it. Jasmine was always demanding money and his mother wouldn't give him a penny on principle. Previously, Austin's salary was enough for fun and partying. All other expenses were completely on his mother. Now he had to support himself and his wife. And as it turned out, his salary was not enough for all that. Austin, since we moved in, you've stopped spending time with me, my wife complained. Why don't we go to a club tonight? Jasmine, what club? I work from morning till night, and I barely have enough money to make ends meet. How long are you going to be your mother's apprentice? Asked the disgruntled wife. You can't make a deal with your own mother. I already have. Austin replied with irritation in his voice. You couldn't live in her house on your own, so we moved out. You can forget about clubs and restaurants now. All set. Jasmine was indignant. Your mother showed us from the very beginning that we are unnecessary. She was trying to get us to move into a rented apartment. If you'd done anything around the house, none of this would have happened. So it's all my fault? Well, I'm sorry. You should have told me you didn't want a wife, but a housekeeper. I've never held a rag or a frying pan since I was a kid. And you thought that if I married you, I'd become a cook and a cleaner. Wrong, hubby. If you can't earn a decent living for your wife, that's your problem and you don't need to put it on your head. Letting out her anger, Jasmine immediately made a cute face, stretched her lips and slammed her long eyelashes. Well, darling, why don't you ask your mother for money? Darling, Austin answered in her tone of voice, don't you want to help me solve our problems? How? Like getting a job, he suggested. Oh, really? Are you kidding? What will my friends say? The girl said she was scared. They'll laugh at me. What's so funny about working? Only losers and peasants work. Do you think my mother and I are losers? Was your father, who made a million dollars, a loser or a villain? Her husband's example stumped Jasmine, but she quickly thought of something to answer. My father is an exception, and you're a loser. Couldn't agree with your mother on the basics. Now you're just a coward to her. I have a feeling this conversation isn't going to get us anywhere, Austin concluded. Whether you like it or not, you're going to have to learn how to run a household. I don't have a single fresh shirt left. The refrigerator is empty. There's a thick layer of dust on the furniture and on the floor. I can't go on like this. Yes, I agree. I don't want to live in filth. I'm sick of eating your scrambled eggs and store-bought dumplings. I'm going to my mom's. When you get rich, call me. Jasmine gathered her things and left, slamming the door loudly. Austin didn't hold her back figuring that without her, it would be easier for him to go back to his mother's house and maybe get her to make him his deputy. And he had miscalculated. Donna, after listening to her son's sob story about his wife leaving him, decided to give him a second chance. She trusted him to run the business for the duration of her business trip. Donna had been planning to open a branch in another city for years. Now she was on her way to take care of it locally. She left Louise to look after Austin, the girl had studied the details of production during her work, and now she could understand all the nuances as well as the owner of the enterprise. Sometimes Donna would say in her heart of hearts, I wish you were my daughter. You and I would have broken mountains together. After his mother's departure, Austin returned to her home and the same day did not fail to tell the news to his wife. Jasmine had been living in her parents' house for a few days, but did not know how to move out. Her mother brought another Alfonso Lubovnik with whom she squandered the rest of her husband's fortune. She gradually sold off expensive furniture, 
her jewelry and talked about selling the car and the house. To her daughter's unhappy reproaches, she answered the same thing. You first lived with your husband as many years as I lived. Make him earn the same fortune as your father earned and then dispose of it. When she learned of the change in Austin's life, Jasmine rushed to him the same day. We must take advantage of the situation, she instructed her husband. Now do you have access to your mother's money, you can transfer a small amount from the company account to your own account, which will be enough for us at first, and gradually you will gain her trust and take over the reins. Do you think it's so easy to withdraw money from the company's account? Austin doubted his wife's words. I'm sure it won't be that easy for you, she replied. You're a smart, educated man, and who would notice a small amount of money in such a huge enterprise? Besides, no one will dare say anything to you. You are the son of the owner, and therefore the future director. Austin didn't like his wife's idea, but she had a good point. Of course, he was entitled to his mother's money, and there might never be a better opportunity. After a little thought, the man decided to act. He realized that the old employees who had worked at the company since its founding, he did not help him. But among the newcomers, there was a young man, arrogant for the reward. After a few days, Austin and his wife could afford to hire a housekeeper, make a few new clothes, even pay off the debt to his mother, Jasmine. Now they could go to clubs and dine in restaurants. To Luisa's questions, Austin answered in a commanding voice, don't poke your nose where it doesn't belong. This is my mother's business, which means it's mine. I think Donna should know about it, the assistant said. She knows, the young man assured her. And you're just jealous. You didn't want to meet me, and now you're biting your elbows. But I'm not vindictive. My offer still stands. Why don't we have dinner tonight? I don't think your wife would like that, Louise replied. I don't think she's expecting me for dinner. Every day, Austin became more and more into the role of the boss. He spoke disrespectfully and in a commanding tone to his subordinates, was late for work, or even didn't show up at all. He constantly needed money for his beautiful life, and now he knew where to get it. Austin and Jasmine never denied themselves anything, but the beautiful life of the newlyweds did not last long. Donna soon found out about the shenanigans of her son and daughter-in-law. The business trip had to be interrupted early and returned to the city. Man, Austin was surprised to see his mother on the doorstep. What are you doing here? Living, she answered dryly. But you must be on a business trip. The young man still couldn't believe his eyes. I should be, Donna confirmed, picking up her suitcase. And you're supposed to be at work, should you? Austin glanced at his watch and remained silent. Just then, Jasmine's voice came from upstairs. Austin. Well, how long do you have to wait? I'm going to die of thirst. Jasmine, my mom is here, Austin told his wife. Two minutes later, his sister-in-law was already coming down the stairs to the living room. Donna, you're back already, she asked in an oily voice. We weren't expecting you so early. You mean you haven't had time to spend all my money, she said sternly. I don't know what you're talking about, Jasmine retorted. Austin is at work day and night. I hardly see him. From today, Austin will be at your complete disposal, the woman replied and turned to her son. You no longer work at the company. While Austin and Jasmine, dumbfounded by the arrival of their landlady, stood looking at each other, Donna dragged her suitcase to the second floor and disappeared into her room. But a moment later, she came out of her room and said, and have the house cleared out by tonight. Mother, this is my house too. Don't forget, I'm your own son. Austin resented her. You can't kick me out every time. The deed is mine, but you're not my son anymore. I will not tolerate traitors in my house. I've worked my whole life to make sure you had nothing. I gave you a great education. And how did you take advantage of all that? Steal from me? And then you have the nerve to tell me you're my son. Take your slacker wife and get out of my house. And if you dare disobey me, I'll file a police report on you. After the scandal, Donna locked herself in her room. Trying to distract herself from her heavy thoughts, she unpacked her suitcase, took a hot bath and went to the company. The employees greeted her happily. Donna, I apologize for having to distract you from important negotiations, Louisa said upon meeting her, but don't apologize. The director interrupted her. You did the right thing. A little more and my negotiations would have become irrelevant. At that time, the chief accountant came into the director's office. Come in, Emerald. Donna invited her in. 
and you stay, she said to Louise. The girl remained standing where she was. The chief accountant went to the director's desk and put down a folder of papers. Here is the expense report for the entire period of your absence. Donna looked through the papers carefully and only after studying them to the end asked, Who helped him? Darren, Emerald replied, When I went on sick leave as you instructed, he stayed on for me. Austin promised him a generous reward. Of course, all the operations were not done without my knowledge and strictly out of the money you left behind. I see, Donna said without hiding her disappointment. It was a pity that Austin had chosen to use the opportunity to prove himself as a leader, but I'd rather find out now that he's not capable of replacing me than have him ruin my business later. Donna, did you arrange this trip on purpose? Louise asked. Did you know about it before I called? It was a real and very successful business trip, the director replied, but I didn't immediately decide to entrust my son with the management of the company. I realized that he was inexperienced in this business and I wanted to see how he would deal with the issues that arose, who he would consult, and whether he would do anything at all. On Emerald's advice, I set aside a small amount of money for contingencies. Of course, Austin didn't know anything. It was a test, Donna sighed and added with bitterness in her voice, and he didn't pass it. For several days, the principal looked depressed and preoccupied. She was silent most of the time. When she was alone with her thoughts, she sighed often. Louise tried to stay close to her. She genuinely felt sorry for Donna. It had been a long time since they had met, and she had become a close person to the sisters. Now that the woman was alone, they supported her, for which Donna was grateful to the girls. Ten years had passed. The relationship between mother and son could hardly be called kinship. Austin lived in a rented apartment and worked in a small office in his specialty. With his wife he had long since divorced, Jasmine found a better candidate. They never had children. Louise had been married for several years and was raising a daughter. Martha graduated from high school and went to college. Donna supported the girls in everything. Over the years they had, indeed, become family. One day the director called Louisa into her office and said, I've decided to pass my brainchild on to you. You are the only one who will be able to carry on my work with dignity. And you, are you going somewhere? No, I'll be around. And if you need me, I'll help you. But I'm getting restless. What about Austin? She asked uncertainly. He's your son. Austin is my son by blood, nothing more. You and Martha are my daughters in spirit, and you are more dear to me. I know I can rely on you. Unfortunately for me, I never got to be a mom to Austin. Donna, everyone makes mistakes. Louise tried to stick up for him. I'm sure if he's regretted it many times over. If he had, he'd come and apologize, but he still thinks he's wronged, and I have no desire to prove anything to him. Soon, Louise became director of the company. A year later, Donna died. It turned out she'd been ill for a long time, but she'd never told anyone. Austin, after the funeral, moved into his mother's house, but his joy was short-lived. Donna bequeathed the house to Louise and bought her son a spacious apartment, in addition, she opened a bank account in Austin's name, from which he could withdraw a certain amount each month. What a mother! The man cursed heartily when he heard about his parents' will. Leave everything to some housekeeper, and the son has to live in poverty. The housekeeper has done more for her than her own son. He heard a girl's voice from behind him. Martha looked at Austin with contempt and left the notary's office. The investigator's workday was over, but Edwin stayed late in his office leafing through old cases and making notes in his notebook. He was not yet 30 years old, but for his seriousness and thoughtfulness, for his thorough approach to his work, the young man had been called strictly by his first name almost from the very first days of his service. As long as Edwin could remember, he had always dreamed of going to work for the police. A keen sense of justice in some cases interfered with life, but also helped in life. For example, Edwin's friends were as honest and decent as he was. Tell me who your friend is. Everyone changed for the better around him, although some uncompromisingness made Edwin not very easy to communicate. In addition, the sudden disappearance of his mother, when the boy was barely 12 years old, had an impact on the choice of his future profession. Edwin got up from the table, stretched and did some physical exercises, toning his stiff muscles. Yes, he'd been a little late today, 
but he wasn't in a hurry to get home just yet. I should call my father, it's been a long time since we talked, Edwin thought, and anyway, what should he do there in the village alone? The man dialed a familiar number and smiled when he heard Jared's panting voice. His father would never get used to being able to call back if he didn't have time to pick up the phone. So, wherever he was when he heard the phone ringing, he ran headlong into the house, shouting from afar, I'll run, now! As if at the other end of the wire could hear and wait, Hello, father, what are you doing? Edwin, Edwin imagined his father smiling, it's good to hear from you. What else is there to do in this neck of the woods? I watched the news and went and fed the chickens. The porch has to be done tomorrow. The boards are almost rotted and the village council chairman needs a visit. The other day at the store, the women said they were giving pensioners some kind of financial aid. Maybe I'll get some. You should give up your village, father. Sell the house and move to the city. Why stay alone? We'll buy an apartment here and live together. My salary is decent. It's enough for us, and you're old. If something happens, it's a problem to call an ambulance in your backwoods. It'd take a couple hours. What am I supposed to do in your town, Edwin? Jared said in a guilty voice. You can walk out of the gate and you'll see a lot of people around you. You can have a word with your neighbor or play a game of dominoes with the men. You've had your day and you know all the news. What am I supposed to do in the city? Sit by the TV and wait for you? I'd die of homesickness. I'll miss the open spaces, the nature. As every time this dialogue ended with nothing, they did not come to any decision. Edwin warmly said goodbye and hung up the phone. Daddy, Daddy. How he misses his father. He even missed his village, his rural life. Yes, it's been a long time since he visited his father. He should go to his father's home sometime this weekend. Edwin sat down at his desk again and opened another file. He was in his third year as an investigator. He spent all his free time studying missing persons cases, carefully reading and rereading the information obtained in the course of search activities. He wrote out the most important and useful things in his notebook. One of the main reasons that pushed Edwin to choose law enforcement was the disappearance of his mother. He hoped that by becoming an investigator, he would be able to find at least some traces, at least some information about his mother, ideally even find her if she was still alive. His fingers involuntarily reached for the birthmark on his wrist. It was always like that when Edwin thought of Karen, his mother. He vividly remembered how his mother had stroked his heart-shaped birthmark and pointed to her own, which was exactly the same as her son's, and said, You see, Edwin, on my hand is the imprint of your heart, and on yours is mine. You and I are God-marked. Edwin, Looking through accident reports and descriptions of crime victims in the years after Karen went missing, searched with some fear for special markings, dreading to read about the birthmark on her wrist. But thank God, no such information had yet been encountered, so he did not lose hope that one day he would find his mother. There was a demanding knock on the office door. Come in, Leslie, Edwin answered loudly. He recognized from the knock Leslie, the chief's secretary. A young, very attractive girl entered. You're up late again, Edwin. Shall I make some coffee? Thank you, Leslie. It would be wonderful to have coffee now. Edwin smiled when he saw how happy the girl was to be able to talk to him. She confidently brewed the coffee, took out some scones from the bag she had brought and invited him in. Help yourself, Edwin. I baked them myself. They sat down on the sofa and Edwin sipped the aromatic coffee with pleasure. Why don't you go home? Asked the young man. Your fiancés must be waiting for you. No way, Leslie waved her hand. Are they fiances? Young, green, no prospects. Only entertainment on their minds. Edwin laughed. You're talking like an experienced 40-year-old woman. You're still so young yourself. You need to have fun too. And the fact that your fans are still young is not a disadvantage, but rather a virtue, which, unfortunately, passes with the years. And as for prospects, every general was once a private. If a young man like that were to marry you, he'd rise quickly through the ranks. Come on, Edwin. Leslie turned away resentfully. Why do you keep asking me to marry you? Maybe I have other plans. The girl looked at the investigator with a silly smile. And yourself, Edwin, when do you think to marry? Always alone, day and night at work. You'll remain a pauper. You're eating dry. 
Here and there, sandwiches and coffee. You should find a spouse to look after you, take care of you, feed you like a human being. You sometimes wear the same shirt for days at a time. It's not right. If you had a wife, you'd always sleep at home. Whenever I go home, you're all in your office, looking for something, flipping through old files. That's my job, Leslie, Edwin sighed. Irregular hours. It's the police have irregular hours, the girl disagreed, and the investigator is his own boss. In case of emergency, you'll be called from home, and you even sleep in your office sometimes. What can I do, Leslie? It's my choice. Edwin had long ago noticed the undisguised interest of the boss's secretary in his person. Leslie immediately paid attention to him, even when he, a young graduate of law school, got a job in the investigative committee, at first as an intern, but soon the management, noticing a talented intern who helped solve several cases, transferred him to the position of investigator, and since then has repeatedly noted and encouraged the guy. Once early in his career, he accidentally overheard his secretary talking on the phone. Brianna, I have such great news. Excitedly said Leslie Invisible Interlocutor, we have a new investigator, young handsome, not married. He doesn't seem to have a girlfriend. He's so important and important. My chief said about him, young and early he'll go far. And you know very well, my boss is never wrong. After listening to the unknown Brianna, Leslie replied, slightly lowering her voice. I'll think of something. I'm an interesting girl in every sense. A little persistence and straight to the registry office. You won't believe how old he is, but everyone treats him with respect by his first name and middle name. I don't think anyone would ever think of calling him Edwin, just Edwin. Then Edwin only smiled. It was nice to hear such an opinion about himself from a pretty young secretary, whom almost all police youth run after. But Edwin did not take the inadvertently overheard confession seriously. And in vain, since then, a long siege had begun. Leslie tried with all her might to please to please. Edwin did not want to offend the girl. He liked her, but no more. He had no special feelings for Leslie. He'd seen her and lost his head. It never happened, but the siege had been going on for three years, and the girl was not going to give up her plans. She persistently and systematically continued her flirtations. Can you take me home, Edwin? He heard Leslie's voice. It's getting late. The buses don't run very often. I'm afraid to take a cab alone, and I live in the middle of nowhere. Edwin realized that Leslie was asking him to come over, but he didn't let on. Sorry, Leslie, I've got a lot of work to do. I won't be going home for a while. I might have to spend the night. Why don't you ask one of the guys? They'll drive you home in a squad car, with lights and music. All right, Leslie pressed her lips together resentfully. I'll get home on my own. I'm not a little girl. Goodbye, Edwin. The girl went out unhappily and the young investigator plunged back into the study of old, unsolved cases. It was well past midnight when Edwin closed the last folder for today and rubbed his eyes tiredly. Again, all wasted. Again, not a single thread. Not a single clue. Not a single hint as to where to find his mother. Edwin closed his eyes and in his memory again vividly, as if it was only yesterday, resurfaced that day. He had just turned 12 years old. The school year was over and the long-awaited summer vacation had arrived. In the summer in the village grace, half a day the boys and girls spent on the river, swimming and floundering in the water. They jumped from the bungee, dived from the shore, had fun. And then, a little frozen, we made a fire on the shore and baked the potatoes we had brought with us. Right in the ashes, and ate them, burning and smearing soot on their faces. It was inexpressibly fun. Then they sat on the shore talking lazily and sharing local village gossip. Edwin remembered how that day Diana, the daughter of the village's first gossiper, Mama Whitney, squinted slyly and said, Oh, what do I know? I heard my mother talking to the neighbors yesterday. And what did she say? Tell me, don't keep me waiting, the boys asked. Edwin, don't be offended, said Diana. It's about your mother. Just tell me what she said, the boy said. Mama said that your mother, Aunt Karen, was completely fooled by the visiting foreman. She said she'd forgotten about her family and that she'd lost her conscience. That's not true. Edwin jumped up. Your mom's lying. Everyone knows she's a gossip and spreads it around the village. My mom's not like that. 
Well, I'm selling her for what I bought her for. Diana took offense. The grandmother said the same thing. Edwin rushed home, smearing tears of resentment on his face. When he ran into the yard, he saw his father leaning against the door jamb. What's wrong, Edwin? His father asked worriedly, seeing the state of his son. Father, why did they say all sorts of nasty things about my mother in the village? Edwin asked with his eyes flashing. Ah, that's what you mean, sighed his father. Don't believe anyone, son. It's a village without gossip. And don't think badly of your mother. She only loves you and me. Is it true? The boy smiled hopefully and his tears dried up as if on cue. Of course it's true, Edwin, Gerard hugged him. Our mother will always be with us. You don't listen to anyone. Never. Then the gate creaked and Karen entered the yard, a woman who worked as a milkmaid and had come back from her evening milking. Seeing her husband and son, the woman asked anxiously, Gerard, Edwin, what is it that you are as out of sorts as you are? Edwin rushed to his mother and buried his face on her breasts, breathing in the familiar smell of hay and milk. Whitney's been telling the truth again. Edwin believed it, Jared explained, hiding his eyes. Karen squatted down and looked her son carefully in the eyes. Edwin, son, why are you so upset? Whitney is such a woman, she can't sleep unless she does something nasty to someone. Let's go inside, I'll pour some fresh milk. Edwin, who had calmed down at once, went into the house with his parents and they drank milk and buns that his mother had baked the day before. During the night, Edwin heard his parents' tense voices through his sleep, discussing something behind the wall. And early in the morning, his mother left for her morning milking. Edwin never saw her again. All the next evening, Edwin waited in vain for his mother. Jared paced restlessly from corner to corner, always looking at his watch. His mother was still gone. Finally, unable to bear the strain, Edwin suggested, Father, let me run to the farm, in case something happened. Run, my son, run, exhaustedly fell back in his chair. His hands were trembling. Edwin ran out of the house and ran to the farm, which was on the outskirts of the village. He raced at full speed, and anxiety and worry grew in his chest. There were no more milkmaids on the farm. Only the farm watchman, Justin, was raking the hay between the cow pens. Justin, have you seen my mother? The boy asked panting and stammering with excitement. So she left with all the women. As soon as all the cows were milked, said the old man. Why are you upset? Maybe you missed each other. Although it's been a couple hours already. Justin scratched the back of his head thoughtfully. Edwin ran home out of fear, on his way asking his neighbors if anyone had seen his mother. But they all shrugged their shoulders in surprise. When the tired boy came home, he realized at once that his mother wasn't home. Jared was pulling on his jacket, obviously going somewhere. Dad, where are you going? I'm coming with you. Son, I'll go look for her myself. You stay at home. In case Karen comes home and there's no one home, we'll be looking for each other all night long. And the father, without waiting for his son's reply, went out the gate. Jared returned only in the morning, tired and upset. Well, father, Edwin rushed to him. Did you learn anything? No, son, shook his head. I searched everywhere, even the nearest woods. There's no Karen anywhere. I found her handkerchief in the clearing. Jared pulled his mother's colorful handkerchief out of his pocket. She wore it to work. What shall we do, father? Edwin asked in shock. We must go to the police, to the city. We'll go to the policeman in the morning, and then we'll see what he says. During the night, father and son hardly slept a wink. Only occasionally a doze came on and Edwin fell into a short, restless sleep. It was dawn and Jared and Edwin went to the opposite end of the village, straight to the house of the local policeman. Alex, an elderly man who had worked as a policeman all his life, the local Aniskin, as the villagers affectionately called him, comparing him to the hero of the movie of the same name, was already awake. Gaverlake, Edwin, why did you come running in so early? What happened? My mom is missing, Alex, said Edwin, barely holding himself back from crying. Gaverlick, Gaverlick, tell me what happened. I don't know, Alex, Jared said sadly. After the evening milking, she didn't come back from the farm. I went to look for her. She was nowhere to be found. I only found the handkerchief outside the village. It was an accident. It was lying in the bushes. 
Come on, let's go to the station, ordered the man the station he called his room in the village council. We'll decide what to do. They went hurriedly to the village hall. Everything inside Edwin was clenched with a bad feeling of foreboding, of longing, and a sense of something irreparable. At the station, Alex made him tell everything in detail, gave him a sheet of paper, and told him to write a statement. And he himself called the police in the city and briefly recounted what had happened. As expected, they promised to start investigative measures only in three days. Although they asked Alex to start on the spot already now. After all, a village is not a city. Everything's out in the open, and a person can't disappear without a trace. The measures were carried out for several days. All the milkmaids who worked with Karen were interviewed. They showed that the woman left work with everyone else, but then told everyone that she forgot something and went in the opposite direction. According to the caretaker Justin, the woman never returned to the farm, and she was never seen again. All the time the investigation was going on, Edwin and Jared lived like a volcano, waiting every moment for an eruption. His father was gone, had not shaved for almost a month and looked like an abrek. Edwin tried to calm his father, though even at his age he realized that nothing could be fixed. Even in the most hopeless case, there is still hope. One evening Gerard called his son. Edwin, son, come here. A bad feeling filled Edwin. Did you find out something? Father, is she alive? Edwin, you and I will always wait for our mom and we'll never give up hope. You hear that, son? She's not in any hospitals or morgues. And if she is, that means Karen's alive. Believe it, son. Why are you talking so weird, dad? They just don't investigate anymore. They've done what they need to do and put it away. That's it, Edwin. Many years have passed since then. The village speculated all sorts of things about Karen's disappearance. There was even some mythical maniac, supposedly living in the local woods and attacking young women. Gradually, however, things quieted down. One news story, no matter how loud it was, is replaced by another, and the old one is forgotten. After all, life does not stand still. Edwin lived with his father. Jared never married again and raised his son alone. And Edwin for himself since that time decided that as soon as he finished school, will go to law school and will definitely become an investigator. And then he would look for his mother himself. After school, Edwin immediately went to the city and entered the institute without any problems. It was not difficult, given his persistence and purposefulness. He graduated from the institute as a brilliant lawyer with a red diploma. And his dream came true. He is an investigator in the city investigative committee. And now for three years, every free minute to search for his mother requested cases of lost, as they were called in police circles, compared, read from cover to cover, trying to find something in common with the case of the mother. And most importantly, he checked the descriptions and identities of the unidentified courses to make sure, once again, that mother was not among them. Well, it's time to do the honors. I've got to catch a couple hours of sleep, and in the morning again work, incidents and crimes, serious and not so serious. But nevertheless, the head should be rested. Edwin was still considering whether he should go to his rented apartment or stay the night in his office when suddenly the landline phone rang. It's me. He picked up the receiver. Edwin, this is the duty officer of the department. Could you please come down? We have an unusual incident here. I'm coming, the man said, and hurried out the door. It was fortunate that the investigation committee was located in the police headquarters. In case of an emergency, there was no need to rush from one end of the city to the other. Going down to the first floor, Edwin saw an interesting picture. At the window of the duty officer stood two uncertain-looking women, obviously of no fixed abode. In the hands of one of them was a large bag, from which something was squeaking and swarming. What's going on? Edwin came to the window. These people claim to have found a baby in a garbage dump. What? The man couldn't believe his ears. Call an ambulance immediately. He ordered and took the bag from the woman's hands. The two homeless women moved to the wall and sat down on the bench, and Edwin unzipped the bag and really saw the infant. The baby was in a diaper, but by the look of it was completely unharmed. It was not even crying, but was looking at him with huge clear eyes and babbling in a language only he could understand. My God, what a baby, exhaled the investigator. What happened to you, baby? 
What heartless mother abandoned you in such a cruel way? At that moment, an ambulance arrived and the doctor immediately examined the infant. At first glance, there were no injuries to the baby, but the baby was taken to the hospital for further examination. Now we can start questioning the women who brought the fine to the police station. Except that the women, taking advantage of the commotion, disappeared somewhere. Where are the homeless women? Edwin asked the officer on duty. The young lieutenant on duty almost swore, I got distracted and they're gone. Congratulations, lieutenant, Edwin grumbled. Not only do we have to look for a deadbeat mom, but we've lost our witnesses. Did you even take any statements or at least question them? What did they say? Well, they said they went around our neighborhood, checking the garbage cans for food or anything useful. Looking for food, Edwin mocked, speak normal language. Sorry, Edwin, the lieutenant blushed. We were looking for food or clothes, and we came across this bag. Thought we found something useful, but there was a baby in it. They freaked out. They don't have a cell phone. They brought it here. Did you get any data? What kind of data do they have? They're homeless. Lieutenant, Edwin got mad. I'm gonna reprimand you for inconsistency. What do you mean, homeless? Do you have any information? Do you remember if they addressed each other by name or nickname? Did you notice any distinguishing marks? Think, Lieutenant, get your good name back. The young officer on duty blushed with tension. He closed his eyes, trying to remember every minute. Edwin didn't push him. He knew not to interfere. Let him remember. At last, the lieutenant spoke excitedly. I remembered, Edwin. Honestly, I remembered. Speak quickly or write it down at once before you forget it again. One of them who held the bag addressed her friend Veronica, the other called her Irene, and the Veronica one has a birthmark on her wrist. It looks like a small heart. Edwin suddenly felt the ground go away from under his feet, his head rumbled, and he asked again with dry lips, what did you say? A birthmark on his wrist, in the shape of a heart, like this. He nervously unbuttoned his shirt sleeve and showed his birthmark. The stunned lieutenant nodded confusedly, yes. Almost like that. What is the meaning of all this, Edwin? Do you know this woman? Is she a relative of yours? That's my mother, Lieutenant. Edwin, in the greatest excitement, ran out of the police headquarters and scurried through the surrounding streets, trying to find those women. But it was all in vain. They had vanished into thin air. Edwin returned to the station after several hours of pointless searching. Utterly shattered and depressed, he silently tried not to look at the duty officer went up to his office and collapsed exhaustedly on the sofa. What an idiot I am, thought Edwin, cursing himself with the last words and also scolding the lieutenant. I acted like a rookie. He made nice with the kid and didn't take care of the witnesses. Is that homeless woman really my mom? There's no such thing as coincidence. Then why Veronica and not Karen? Just questions. Only now I know exactly who to look for. I don't have to run around the streets like an idiot. I'm gonna send the precincts out to look for these women, make sketches and see if anyone recognizes them. It's a big city, of course, but there's no such thing as one of the question of the informants will not say anything. After all, it is necessary to go through the shelters for the homeless, the places where the homeless live. There's a whole system of investigative actions. And I, like all so smart and educated and gave in to emotion and rushed haphazardly wandered around the city. What a fool. It was like a dream come true. There was no sleep left in either eye. Edwin got up, went to the bathroom and rinsed his face in the sink. He looked at himself in the mirror and said, the matter has moved on. Congratulations, Edwin. The ice is broken, gentlemen of the jury. When Leslie looked into the investigator's office in the morning, she was surprised at how much the man had changed overnight. He was alert, cheerful, and determined. Edwin, you look so happy. What happened? I heard they found the baby in the trash last night. Yes, Leslie, they did. The hospital called. The baby's fine. He's perfectly healthy. Why are you so happy? I don't understand. Oh, Leslie smiled, Edwin. It's a boy. And he's alive. He will live. Do you want to come with me to the hospital? Check on the family. We'll pick up the bag and diaper he was found in. Sure, I'll do it now, readily agreed Leslie. I'll just ask the chief to leave. Half an hour later, the young people were on their way to the hospital. While Leslie went to the baby, 
Edwin took the necessary things from the chief physician and entered the room where the boy was temporarily placed. As he entered, he stopped in amazement. Leslie was standing at the window, gently holding the baby in her arms and saying affectionately, How tiny you are, how sweet. Don't be afraid, baby, don't be afraid of anything. You are now in safe hands and nothing terrible will happen to you anymore. An episode with a foundling from the legendary movie, the place of meeting cannot be changed came to mind. He even for a moment imagined himself Sharapo, who returned from a combat mission. How good Leslie was with a baby in her arms. And why had he never noticed before that Leslie was so beautiful? And how easy it was to imagine her as a mother. It was as if he were seeing her for the first time. Edwin shook his head, driving away the unexpected thoughts and approached the girl. Well, have you met her? Leslie turned her radiant face to him and spoke trustingly. Edwin, how beautiful he is. Where to put him now? I don't know. Probably an orphanage. And then someone will adopt him. Suddenly, Leslie held the boy to her and turned away. I don't want to. I don't want to leave him. Edwin, what's happening to me? It's like I found my child. Calm down, Leslie. Edwin was embarrassed. It'll pass. You and I will visit him. You're still very young. You'll have lots of children of your own. What a fool you are, Edwin, and also an investigator. Leslie flared up. How will it pass? If I have already felt with all my heart love for this baby, what's that got to do with my babies? And anyway, I'm 25 years old. I'm ready for motherhood. I feel it on the inside. And I want this baby. All right, all right. Give me the boy and let's go to work. They're not gonna give you the baby anyway. At least not right away. You're not married, and they're gonna choose a complete family. There's a lot of delays. Leslie and Edwin returned to the investigating committee, all the way they were silent, immersed in their own thoughts. At the office, Edwin suggested, Why don't we have some coffee? No, thank you, Edwin. Unexpectedly coldly refused Leslie. I'm waiting for the chief. I have to work. Edwin shrugged his shoulders, entered the office and began his work. First of all, he called all the district officers, informed them that he had sent out the sightings and information about the two homeless women and told them to start searching immediately. Then Edwin decided that he had no right to hide such important information from his father and dialed his number. Father, hello, he said into the phone when he heard his native voice. I really need you to drop everything and immediately come to me in the city. If you get ready right now, you'll catch the bus. I'll meet you at the station. Edwin, is something the matter? Jared asked anxiously, are you not ill? It's all right, father. Edwin said soothingly, but I need you here. I'll explain everything when you get here. Hurry up, dad. After that, Edwin finished the main business and asked his boss for a couple of days off, explaining it was a personal problem, so to speak, for family reasons. A couple hours later, he was already at the train station to meet his father. Jared was in his own repertoire. As was always the case when an older man went into town to see his son, he was laden with bags and bags of stuff. They arrived at Edwin's rented apartment, and Jared began to pull out of his many bags salted lard, jars of pickled mushrooms, sauerkraut, pickles, and tomatoes. And, of course, a few dozen fresh eggs from his chickens. Well, father... Where did you bring so much? Edwin laughed. Do you think I'm starving here? I know how you eat here, grumbled his father. You eat all kinds of chemicals. You drink coffee all the time. I brought my own liquor, homemade, and my own products, clean and fresh, from the village. All vitamins. Come on, sit down. I'll set the table. Jared with jokes and jokes sliced delicious, with veins, lard. He poured small pickled opiates on a plate seasoned them with oil, vinegar, and onion rings. He put out sauerkraut that smelled of spicy horseradish and boiled potatoes, also seasoning them with the aromatic oil from their village creamery. Edwin, though he was not hungry, looked at these appetizing dishes and wanted to eat. Well, that's right, he thought, we'll talk over the meal. What's the matter with you? At last my father asked, pouring thick, fragrant liquor into glasses. Edwin drank the liquor and looked straight into Jared's eyes. I think I found my mother. His father choked on his liquor and coughed. Edwin tapped him on the back. Hush, father. You don't worry so much. Nothing is clear yet. Father sternly ordered. 
Tony. You see, father, a very strange thing happened tonight. And Edwin told his father everything in detail, without omitting the slightest detail. Jared was silent for a long time. Finally, he looked up at his son. I knew this would happen someday. I don't understand, dad. Edwin stammered. What does that mean? You knew mom was alive. For how long? Maybe you always knew where mom was and you just didn't tell me. How could you, father? No, Edwin, it's not like that. Father smiled sadly. I didn't know at first either. I was worried too. I was afraid Karen was in trouble. But a year later, a letter came. You can read it for yourself if you want. I always carry it in my wallet. My father took his wallet out of his pocket and took out a greasy piece of paper. It was evident that the man had often reread it. Edwin excitedly took the piece of paper and saw the lines written in his mother's childish handwriting. Dear Gerard, I am writing to you only now because I was afraid to confess my sin before, but my feelings were stronger than I was. I couldn't fight it. I cursed myself with the last words. I roared like a beluga at night. I miss Edwin. I miss you. I miss my former calm and happy life, but my conscience won't let me go back. I chose love so abruptly and unexpectedly covered me with a head and left my closest to me son and husband. But God has already punished me. My chosen one turned out to be a cruel and rude man, and my heart feels that this will not end well. I don't know how long I have to live. I don't think much, but just know one thing. For the rest of my life, I'm gonna regret what I did. And every minute, every breath I take, I'll remember that I was once a happy mother and wife, don't let it go to your head, Karen. The line sprawled before Edwin's eyes, traitorously filled with tears. He dropped the letter and covered his face with his palms. How could it be, father? Why didn't you tell me? All this time I was only afraid of one thing, that my mother was dead. In every line of the letter there is such pain, such shame and such anguish that I should have looked for her long ago to save her. But where to look, my son? My father grinned bitterly there was no return address, not even a postmark. Maybe she passed him on with someone, and you've been through so much since Karen disappeared. I didn't dare to worry you again. You were just starting to calm down. I'm sorry, son. Edwin shook himself and looked at his father again. All right, father. This matter is closed. Now all we have to do is search and wait. Now, at least, I'm pretty sure it was mom. Her birthmark. But for some reason, her friend called her Vera. The next day Edwin went to work, even though he'd only used one day off, but sitting at home in the dark was unbearable. Here at least he was in the thick of things, could distract himself. Strangely enough, Leslie hadn't looked in on him once today. It wasn't like the girl. Suddenly Edwin realized that he missed Leslie, that he missed her care, her flirtations. He decided to go to the reception area to see the supervisor and find out how the girl was doing. To Edwin's surprise, Leslie was not there. He knocked on the accounting desk and asked the girls. Girls, I don't see Leslie. Is she okay? Well, you're up late, Edwin. The girls jumped. Leslie took a vacation. She's getting married. She's getting ready for the wedding. What wedding? Edwin marveled. What wedding? What are you talking about? Just like that, marriage. Did you think she would chase after you and suffer for the rest of her life? Every girl dreams of marriage. Edwin suddenly felt hurt. How could this be? Only 24 hours ago, he was sure that he seriously liked Leslie. She was showing such obvious signs of attention. He had not doubted for a moment that the girl was determined to win him over. Everything was transparent and absolutely predictable. And now she suddenly decided to marry. To whom on earth? Edwin strode into the study and felt deceived. For so many years, Leslie, a loyal admirer, was always there, making coffee, bringing him pastries, treating him, caring for him, and suddenly it's all gone. And the girl really was a great cook. So why did she suddenly change? Maybe he'd done something to offend her. But Edwin, having analyzed his behavior with Leslie, had not found anything that could offend or insult her. All right, that's enough. Edwin decided, we'll talk about this later. Enough of this nonsense. There's a lot of important things to be done, and the most important of them all was to find mom. The investigators started calling around to see what the results of the search for the homeless women were. So far, no results. 
Then he started examining the bag containing the abandoned baby. It was just a bag. Large utility bag. Obviously old, used for years, worn down in places. Looking carefully inside, Edwin's gaze suddenly caught on a piece of paper. He carefully removed the small piece and took out a magnifying glass to make out what was written on it. There it was. It was a scrap of a check. A regular supermarket check. The man carefully put the scrap of the check in a plastic bag and ran to the lab to give it to the experts. They would be able to squeeze everything they could out of the scrap. The diaper didn't tell us anything. It's just an ordinary baby diaper, like millions of them. No identifying inscriptions or markings. Suddenly, the phone rings. I'm listening. Edwin, I think I have something for you. He heard the satisfied voice of an elderly policeman, Adam, from the outskirts of the city. Speak up, Adam. Don't be long. Edwin got excited. What do you have? Yesterday, I was in an abandoned barracks well, where our local homeless people cluster. Showed me the sketches of these two women. Yeah, recognized them. Some time ago, two years or so, they'd been hanging around the barracks. One, Irene, had been homeless for a while. The other one, they say she's new. What do you know about her, the other one? Edwin hurried on. Nothing. I mean, not at all. They say she lost her memory, couldn't even remember her own name. The same Irene found her in a vacant lot, unconscious, beaten up, frosty outside, snowdrifts all around. She dragged the poor thing to the heating duct and got out. She called her Veronica herself. But here's the thing, the precinct commander's a little confused. Just talk, Adam. Why do I have to pull every word out of you? You see, Edwin, when they got settled in this abandoned barracks, an old bum took a fancy to the new girl. He started harassing her, claiming her as his own. Iron took her rescue friend and ran away from the place. They never came back. So where are they now? Edwin was upset. We're looking, Edwin, we're looking. I've already got the local gang involved. We'll find them. Don't worry. It's only a matter of time. Edwin thanked the policeman, said goodbye, and hung up the phone. Poor mom. What had she been through? He involuntarily stroked the heart on his wrist. His heart began to ache. Edwin went to the window and looked out at the city drowned in gloom. Here and there were the lights of apartments and street lamps. The city seemed peaceful and calm, but somewhere out there, Outside the window walked his mother, who had lost her memory, perhaps hungry and cold. He suddenly felt a great desire to share his worries with someone. If only Leslie were around sweet and kind, Edwin would tell her everything. And she would have understood, sympathized, tried to comfort. Suddenly, there was a tentative knock at the door. Come in. Edwin broke away from his musings. Leslie hesitantly entered the office. Hello, Edwin, said the girl quietly. Leslie, rejoiced Edwin, you disappeared so suddenly. They say you are to be congratulated. Are you getting married? And who is the lucky man? Edwin realized he was saying the wrong thing. What an idiot. He mentally scolded himself. I don't know what to ask. I'm going out, Edwin, nodded the girl sadly. I've come to say goodbye. I'm going on maternity leave after the wedding. If it works out. How fast you're going, Edwin joked inappropriately again. What's the matter with me? He was upset again. Leslie, sit down. Let's talk. He invited the girl to the coffee table. Leslie obediently sat down. Do you want me to make some coffee? But I don't have any pastries as good as yours. How about a cookie? No, thanks. Leslie said no. What's new with you guys? Did you find any witnesses? Did you find out anything about my baby? What do you mean, my baby? Edwin was surprised. That's what it means, Edwin. The girl raised her chin. He's mine. I'm collecting documents for his adoption. And now the child's family will be complete. It was like a puzzle was forming in Edwin's mind. Is that why you decided to get married? What did you guys think? That I'd devote my whole life to you. I want a family. And I love that boy at first sight. I have an admirer who would do anything for me. So I'll marry him and will adopt the baby. Edwin sat down beside Leslie and took the girl's hands in his palms. Leslie, he began softly. So much has happened in the last couple of days that my head is spinning. And in that time, I've realized two things. One, my mother is alive and I'm going to find her. And the second thing is that I'm just a blind, indifferent chump. 
I almost lost the best girl in the world. Leslie raised her tear-stained eyes to Edwin. Is it true, Edwin? Enough with the first name. Smiled, Edwin. I'm opening your heart, confessing my love. And you all, Edwin. Edwin, as if tasting the name, slowly answered Leslie and the baby. Suddenly, the girl was alarmed. What about the child? If I don't marry, they won't give it to me. Her eyes filled with tears again. Let's not be in a hurry, Leslie, hugged the girl, Edwin. Do not worry, we will solve problems as they come. You know what I'm like. It means a lot to me to take such a big step. All right? All right. And now I'm inviting you to the village dinner. My father's come and brought me so many delicious things that now, as an honest man, I'm obliged to treat you. I'm not the only one who has to treat myself at your expense, the man joked. They left the police building and walked slowly toward the house in which Edwin lived. Along the way, he told Leslie as much as he could about his childhood, how his mom had disappeared, how they had lived all those years with his dad, and why he decided to become an investigator. And I've been looking for my mom all these years. I've been systematically organizing my information, all to no avail. And then suddenly, as they say, without a declaration of war, she appeared in the department. And on my watch, as divine providence pushed, the girl nodded understandingly and you missed one thing. Really, said Edwin, surprised. What did I miss? The fact that you almost found your mother only because of the baby that those women found and brought to the police. That's right, laughed Edwin. I owed that to the baby. When they entered the apartment, Edwin's father was already meeting them at the door, glancing anxiously at his watch. Oh, son, are we having company? Jared smiled. Yes, father. Meet Leslie. Leslie introduced Edwin. And this is my father, Gerard. Come in, Leslie. Gerard fussed. I'll set the table. Nature's bounty, so to speak. My father ran into the kitchen and hurriedly began to set out the treats, saying, What a joy. How long I had hoped Edwin would start a family. What a thing to see, such a positive, educated man with a solid job. But he's still a bum. It's high time for me to take care of my grandchildren. Come on, father. Embarrassed son interrupted. You've already married me. So it's high time. You can't move on your own, so you need a push. The three of them were sitting in the small kitchen of Edwin's rented apartment, eating appetizing country gifts of nature, as Jared called them, with the old man's sweet specialty liqueur. And everyone was so warm and relaxed, cozy and kindred. Finally, father couldn't take it anymore. Edwin, have you heard from Karen? Edwin pushed his plate away and told his father everything he had learned. That's the way it is, father. I have a feeling mom will be found soon. So many people are already looking for her. He took a sketch out of his pocket and handed it to his father. Here, see what she looks like now. Jared gently took the sheet with the police artist's sketch and stared at it. Karen has gotten older. I'm not getting any younger either. My poor girl. What a lot she's been through. It's all right. Just find her as soon as you can, son. I'll make sure she gets well and remembers everything. Remember us. Suddenly, Leslie held out her hand. Come on, give me the sketch. She looked carefully at the sheet and thoughtfully said, I think I've seen this woman somewhere before. What? Edwin couldn't believe his ears. Where? When? Wait, Edwin. Let me remember. Furrowed her brow, Leslie somewhere recently. I think it was in the neighborhood where I live. That's right, at the market. Leslie slapped her hand on her forehead. I've seen it. We have a makeshift market near our house. They sell country produce and stuff. A lot of homeless people hang out there. At the end of the day, the vendors give them what they haven't sold, perishables. That's where I saw this woman a few times, with a girlfriend, by the way. Your mom's the quiet one, but her friend is a fighter she's a fighter. Edwin was pacing the kitchen in excitement. It's all one and the same. Leslie, you are a miracle. I suggest we spend the night at my place tonight. Tomorrow we'll go to your market and search till we win. Dad, will you come with us? I will, son. I can no longer sit in four walls and wait for news from you. I want to act myself. Barely waiting for the morning, Edwin called his boss and again agreed on time off. However, he had to listen to lectures on the subject. Young people are like that. They don't know what they want. They need time off, and then they do not need it. It's time to become more serious, 
Mr. Investigator. The three of them had a quick breakfast and went to the market near Leslie's house. The market was just filling up with vendors. Rare passersby were glancing around the stalls in search of what they had come here for in the early morning. Gradually, the rows of stalls filled with vendors and customers, but Edwin searched in vain for a familiar face in the crowd. Finally, he turned to his father and Leslie. Shall we come back tonight, toward the close of the market? Leslie agreed, but Jared was adamantly opposed. No way. If Karen's here and this is the only place she knows where she can be found, I'm not going to take a step out of here. Whatever you want, I'm staying. I can manage on my own, son. You go on, mind your own business. I'll sit here on the bench and wait. I'm not used to waiting a long time. God willing, if I see Karen, I'll bring her back to your apartment and then we'll figure it out. And that was that. Father remained at his post and Edwin and Leslie went to the hospital to visit the family. But at the hospital, they were shocked. Your baby has been taken to an orphanage. The baby is perfectly healthy. What would he do in a hospital? Distressed to the point of tears, Leslie leaned against the front door of the hospital and closed her eyes. Don't worry, Leslie. Edwin reassured her. We will find our boy. Now I'll find out where exactly he was sent and we'll follow him right away. When they arrived at the orphanage, they saw a bleak picture. In the nursery, small children, with a small difference in age, were playing. When they saw the man and woman enter, the eyes of the little ones were filled with such hope that they felt uncomfortable. They quickly passed by, trying not to keep their eyes on anyone, so as not to get anyone's hopes up. In the infant room, Leslie found her family at once and ran up to him. My little one, don't cry, mommy is near, she gently spoke, holding him to her breast. Edwin was once again amazed at Leslie's transformation. Here she is no longer a fragile girl, but a real mother able to protect her child from all adversity. And at once everything became clear and understandable. Edwin realized what he would do next. Everything looked so simple that he felt that what he was about to say to Leslie was the most necessary and the most right thing that should happen. Leslie, he said softly, we must apply for a registry office immediately. We'll get married and we'll take the baby for ourselves. Adopt him. Would you agree? The girl's look of joy and gratitude answered for her. Edwin hugged Leslie with the baby and said, We'll do everything by the book with you later, okay? And a romantic marriage proposal. And a beautiful wedding with a white dress and veil. The most important thing right now is that we don't lose our baby, okay? But I'll ask your parents for your hand in marriage by all means. I am an orphan, Edwin smiled Leslie. I will bless myself. They went to the office of the director of the orphanage and agreed that the child will not be given to anyone for adoption. Still, being an investigator for the investigative committee has its advantages. Full of hopes and plans for the future, the young people decided to stop by Edwin's house, have a snack and go to the market, where the father kept his post. But just as they entered the apartment, they were surprised to hear cheerful voices coming from the kitchen. In the utmost excitement, Edwin ran into the kitchen and stopped in amazement. Sitting at the table were Gerard, a strange woman, and her. His mother, so dear, so close, and yet a bit of a stranger at the same time. Mom. There was an awkward silence at the table. And the first to break it was his mom. She stood up, came to Edwin, looked at him in silence for a long time, then laid her head on his chest and cried. Edwin, my son. How long it has been since I have seen you? Edwin embarrassed embraced his mother and quietly said, Come on, Ma, don't cry. Everything has passed. You are with us now. We're together. And you're in no danger anymore. Karen took her son's hand and stroked the birthmark affectionately. Looking at my heart on my wrist, I always thought of you, Edwin. Gerard wiped away her tears with the palm of his hand and said cheerfully, That's it, Karen. All the bad stuff is over. Meet Edwin Leslie, this is Irene, our mom's guardian angel. Hello to the fair company, smiled Irene. They moved the treats into the living room, as the small kitchen was no longer big enough for everyone. At the table, Gerard turned to Irene. Tell me, Irene, how you found Karen, how you saved her. Tell me about yourself. What's there to tell? Irene grinned wryly, no family. I sold my house and moved in with my husband. We lived together for five years. 
Then he brought a young mistress into the house and they threw me out on the street. No money, no papers. That's how I got homeless. It wasn't easy. Cold, hunger. It's good that my arms and legs are intact. I'd work a little for food. I'll go through the garbage, find some clothes. What can I say? I had to beg, beg for alms, especially hard in winter. Our brother settles on a heating main in the cold. Jared moved over to his wife and put his arm around her shoulders. She took off her top coat. Ironing continued, wrapped the poor thing up as best she could, and dragged her through the snow. I'm not strong enough. And Veronica, excuse me, Karen was unconscious. I dragged her with her fellow homeless. We put her in the warmth, boiled water, wiped off the blood, gave her some brewed herbs, and some vodka, of course. We have only one cure for the cold. Little by little, your mother began to revive. In a few days, she came to her senses, but she couldn't remember anything, not even her name. So I gave her the name Veronica, so she wouldn't lose hope. Irene was sad. You see, Veronica, your luck has changed. You found your own. And I, with my name, will probably only find love, the woman joked wryly. Jared, Edwin, the mother looked pleadingly at her husband and son. We're not leaving Irene, are we? Yes, she's done so much for me and she saved me once in the barracks, from a rapist. Of course we won't, Karen, said the father, Irene. Will you come with us to the village? It's a big house. There's plenty of room for everyone, and Edwin will help us with the paperwork for his job. Won't you, son? Of course, Iron. Thank you for your mom. You're not alone now, either. Edwin's a little confused. I'm sorry, mom. Maybe you don't like to tell me this, but how did you end up out there in the wasteland in winter? It was my own fault, Edwin, sighed his mother. I didn't realize my happiness. A construction crew came to our village to repair the couch. You, Edwin, were only 12 at the time. And their foreman began to court me, complimenting me, declaring his love. He got me all dizzy. I couldn't take it. My sin. I agreed to drop everything and follow him to the ends of the earth. I lost my head. I went back to the farm that day, forgot something. So he was waiting for me at the farm. Make up your mind, he says, it's now or never. He said I'd throw everything at your feet. Run with me, our love will survive and win. Why should I have such happiness as you, my family? I don't deserve it. I have sinned grievously. You have long since atoned for your sin with your suffering, mother, Edwin said quietly. Thank you, son. So he put me in the car and drove me into town. Didn't even let me say goodbye to you to tell you. Later, he said. When we got to town, he locked me in the house. He wouldn't let me talk to anybody, wouldn't let me go anywhere alone, controlled me in everything. He forbade me to make friends, to be friends with neighbors. And after a while, he started to drink and get his hands dirty. Once he beat me badly, I thought I wouldn't survive. I wrote a farewell letter and tearfully asked my neighbor to give it to you. But I didn't want you to know where I was. I was unbearably ashamed. That's how I lived afterwards. I endured beatings, humiliation, bullying. Once I said goodbye to my life, I couldn't take it anymore. So I threw myself out of the window. That winter when Irene found me, the last thing I remember was looking up, crying. Then I took a step forward and it was dark. I woke up once from the pain and saw Archie dragging me behind the house to the vacant lot. And I lost consciousness again. I woke up on the heating main and my head was empty, like a blank slate. Bovo, Irene nodded, a blank slate. You can write whatever you want. I had to learn everything. And today, we went to the market in case we got lucky and got some food. I looked and my Veronica had stopped like a stumbling block, standing there shaking, tears running down her eyes. And Jared comes running up, and he starts hugging and crying. It's like an Indian movie. And she let out a tear. Everyone laughed, mentally thanking Irene for defusing the situation. Then the evening of the meeting smoothly turned into an evening of memories. Soon the tipsy older generation began to sing folk tunes and Leslie whispered to Edwin, why don't we leave them and come to my place? I have a small apartment, but it's my own. I got it from my grandmother. Edwin nodded and turned to those sitting at the table. You stay and Tanya and I will go to her place. Leslie, it was very nice to meet you. Karen approached the girl and hugged her gently. You are very nice. I hope we will be related soon. 
My son will be very happy around you. I see you love him. The next day, Edwin and Leslie went to the registry office early in the morning, right by the opening of the registry office, to apply and set the day of the wedding. The employees of the institution entered into the position of the future newlyweds, as the case concerned the adoption of a child, and set the date of the wedding for the very near future. When Edwin and the uncomprehending Leslie entered the room where the injured girl was lying, she jumped up framed. You're not going to let Archie go, are you? You will put him in jail? Don't worry, it's all gone. You'll never see him again. I just have one question. Would you like your baby back? What do you mean, give it back? The girl was confused. He's dead. No, sweetheart, replied Edwin gently. He was saved. He's alive and well. So what do you think you're going to do with him? The girl suddenly pressed her lips together and looked hatefully out the window. I don't want that child. He's that monster's son. I don't want to even touch someone who has my tormentor's blood in him. And the girl turned away and laid down on the bed. That's all, Leslie said Edwin, closing the door of the room. All the formalities have been observed. The child has been abandoned. Knowing who the father is, you still want to adopt him. Edwin, it's not the baby's fault, not in Leslie. Whosoever blood is in him, it's as hot and red as any child's. And a baby needs a family, a mommy and a daddy just like every other baby in the world. It needs love and affection. And how our son will grow up depends only on ourselves. Dry shoots don't give roots, but if you water it, it will bloom. So you and I will bring up our son so that he will grow up a worthy man. My God, Leslie. Edwin was touched, how young you are, but already so wise. A year later, Edwin and Leslie came to the village on vacation and their little son, Jared, it would be good to be a little time in nature at his grandparents. The boy had just begun to walk and say his first words and was so cute and restless, pleasing his parents and making his grandparents beg to bring their grandson. In the evening, when Jared had fallen asleep, the adults gathered in the courtyard in the gazebo, where Karen set the table with Jared's gifts of nature and his specialty pours. Irene, a friend of Karen's, soon approached as well, the woman considered herself Jared's second grandmother and often bickered unkindly with her friends over the right to babysit the boy. Irene, too, had been affected by the change. She met a nice man in the village, a widower, and moved in with him. Soon they want to formalize their relationship. Together they sat in a gaze boat, drinking naluka, eating mushrooms and cabbage, talking leisurely and sharing the news. And everyone in his heart thanked God that life had been merciful to them. They found family, love, peace, and happiness. And what else do you need in this life? Nothing more.